Good morning and welcome to the August 13th, 2019 Calaveras County Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, we'll begin, I call this meeting the order, call it to order. Madam Clerk, do you want to start closed session? Item one on the closed session agenda is conference with labor negotiator pursuant to government code section 54957.6, county designated labor negotiator Judy Hawkins regarding employee organization Calaveras County Sheriff's Management Unit. Are there, is there any public comment regarding the Calaveras County Sheriff's Management Unit in this board action? Yes, there is. Um, hello, how's everybody doing today? You guys look great. Um, in 2015, I had to come back to the county because there was uh, things were in chaos up in West Point. Uh, we were having problems on the property, and um, you know the one saving grace was the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department. And I'd like you to look favorably on them because when I came back. Uh, I had a meeting with several meetings with Gary Kuntz uh, regarding the situation the county was in and he would always he, he would always uh, state that I had to do something uh, really it's not my position to do anything in this county um, but what I did notice was that the cars they were driving were horrible you people have done a fine job you've been here a while and providing for that uh, department and hopefully you can uh, you can provide for the the workers as well so look favorably on them thank you thank you item number two item number two conference with labor negotiator pursuant to government code section 54957.6 closed session with county designated labor negotiator judy hawkins regarding employee organization calaveras county public safety employees association is there a public comment regarding this item yes much the same um looking favorably on these people because uh, they are our defense against the bad ones, the people that want to do harm, the people that want to, uh, that want to cause chaos. Um, today, this morning, I will be over at the Sheriff's Department because there was an incident this weekend. I wasn't around. I came back late last night, and I have, to, uh, and I have some uh, things I have to do. Um, of course, it regards the Jeff property. And, yeah, uh, as you know, that's a criminal element over there. And we rely on these people to uh, to protect us. Uh, we also rely on the county, and we'll be talking a little more about that. Thank you. Item number three. Item three, pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation, Donald Otten v. County of Calaveras, case numbers ADJ956, 1858 and ADJ 1013270. Public comment regarding this item. I know absolutely nothing about that. But usually, in a case like this, the county's in the wrong. Because, let's face it, you don't have the best counsel in the world. Item number four. Item four, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation, one case, pursuant to government code section 54956.9D4. Is there any public comment regarding this item? As you know, uh, the, there's not much information given on, on, uh, on these items, so you basically can uh, drive it into, as long as it's relevant, uh, whatever you want. So, uh, consciously, you know, this uh, let's take a situation like this, like the Jeff property. Sooner or later, this is going to turn into legal count, legal action against the county. It, it's inevitable, and I've been saying this for years. You guys should have really, really uh, condemned that property. Uh, you know, in in 2016, when when the problem really took off and it really heated up. Um, but because of a previous supervisor, Steve Walensky, you ended up in a situation where they, uh, where they gained some rights there, uh, rights that they would not normally have. So, um, you know, I'm gonna, I feel good about taking money from you folks. Thank you. Seeing no further public comment, we will move into closed session.
Good morning and welcome back to the August 13, 2019 meeting of the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors. If you are able, will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Becky, would you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to see who's paying attention. Very good, we'll move into announcements. Report of today's closed sessions. Item one, conference with labor negotiator. Pursuant to government code section 54957.6, county designated labor negotiator, Judy Hawkins, regarding employee organization, Calaveras County Sheriff's Management Unit. There was no reportable action taken. Item two, conference with labor negotiator pursuant to government code section 54957.6, closed session with county designated labor negotiator Judy Hawkins regarding employee organization, Calaveras County Public Safety Employees Association. There was no reportable action taken. Item three, pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation, Donald Otten v. County of Calaveras, case numbers ADJ9561858 and ADJ1013970. There was no reportable action taken. And item four, Conference with Legal Counsel, Anticipated Litigation, Initiation of Litigation, One Case, Pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D4, there was no reportable action taken. Okay, we'll move on to the, the rest of the announcements. Announcements. This is a time for county staff to provide updates of upcoming county events that may be of interest to the public. Supervisor Mills? Yes, only to announce that uh, a week ago Thursday, in conjunction with the Calaveras and the Tuolumne Environmental Health Departments, uh, Supervisor Rodeford from Tuolumne County, um, we also had the Bureau of Reclamation present. Uh, two members of the Water Board went out to Maloney's and uh, did a um, random sampling at various locations that we chose and they were unable to find any toxic genes present in the blooms that were uh, in the water there. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be cautious when uh, swimming or with your dogs, but at the same time uh, they will be doing some additional testing just to ensure over the holiday weekend that everything continues to be safe. So New Maloney's is, is a good spot right now but uh, it doesn't mean that every pond and reservoir in Calaveras County is safe. So I just want to be sure that people exercise caution, with, especially with their animals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Announcements from staff? Thanks. Good morning, Bart. Jeff White, your interim chief building official. I want to give you an update on track it. Uh, the uh, go live date will be August 29th. And what that means is we will have a shutdown in, on the Wednesday before because of a software migration of data. So we're trying to get everybody aware of the uh, limitations that we will be up against during that uh, particular day. If all goes well, and we don't have any reason to believe it won't go well, we will have uh, um, training for staff there will be an, a representative from Trackett here to, um, on the, on, in our office to keep track of Trackett. And so we'll see how everything goes and work out the bugs. So we want to make sure that we have some signs up on our counter uh, to make the public aware of uh, that particular date as being a um, limited amount of uh, processing that we can do. So that's where we are with Trackett right at the moment. And if you have any questions, Stan could probably do the technical piece. Thank you very much. Josh. Good morning, board. Joshua Pack, your director of public works. Uh, just bringing in and working with the clerk, um, identified a clerical error in item 12 of today's agenda. It doesn't affect the, res uh, it doesn't affect the item going before you. 
But in the um, agenda, uh, uh, in the discussion and summary, um, a bond number in the amount of $160,500 was listed. That's the incorrect amount. The correct amount is $372,000. It is correct in the package to you today, um, but just the language in here, it was a clerical error from a, from a, prior, um, uh, a prior item. I apologize about that error. I wanted to bring it to your attention. It does not affect um, the item being approved today, but um, in working with the clerk, we recommended that this was the appropriate action to bring to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cowan? I was really going to try not to cry. Um, I just wanted to, and in case anyone in the public has missed uh, any announcements or rumors or anything, uh, my last day with the county will be September 1st. Uh, it's been an honor to serve uh, the constituents of this county and the taxpayers of this county. Uh, it's really been an honor. Um, I really appreciate uh, this board and the prior boards uh, in working with me and supporting with me. Um, really special department heads and staff here that we have at the county. I'm going to miss uh, a lot of those relationships. We've done a lot of really good things here. Um, I am uh, here every day trying to work on transition in my office. Uh, I've done a really good job building my office up, so I have no concerns um, in terms of them being able to move forward, getting through the audit that's coming up. and. Moving on, my assistant auditor controller, Kathy Gomes, will be assuming my responsibilities until the board takes an action for appointment. Uh, it's my recommendation for appointing my assistant, uh, Kathy Gomes, for the remainder of my term. Um, again, my, uh, my door is open. Uh, if any of you have any questions before I, I head on out to my next adventure, and um, you know, I just want to say thank you, and I appreciate uh, working with all of you, and um, you know, I'm sorry I'm going to miss the cannabis conversations that are coming up. No, I'm not. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's really, been, it's really been a treasure, and this has been really special in my career. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank you very much for your 13 years, 13 years, right, of service uh, to the county and friendships that you've made and, and work that we've accomplished together. So yep. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, board. I just want to announce um, the county's plan to move forward with the Voters' Choice Act. What this means, in summary, is that um, all voters will be mailed a ballot. We'll have four vote centers countywide. The difference between a vote center and a polling place is, historically, a polling place can only serve those voters that live directly around that location. A vote center will be able to serve all voters countywide, so any voter could go to any vote center and exchange their ballot, vote in person, or drop off a ballot. Two of those locations will be open 10 days prior to the election, and another two locations will be open four days, including election day. Um, we have our election administration plan, which basically outlines um, the county's process and what we're going to do with this new act and how we're going to run elections. That is on our website and it's open for public comment and review. Important dates to note are August 23rd we'll be holding a public meeting as well as a language accessibility meeting. August 26th um, we'll be holding a voters accessibility meeting, meaning basically how to make the locations as accessible as possible to all voters. Um, September 12th, the public comment period ends, and then September 13th, we'll be holding an additional public, public meeting, um, after which we'll revise the election administration plan and repost it, and we'll be open for an additional 14-day public comment period. So if anyone has any questions about the plan, please send them our direction. And I want to thank also... Um, IT for all of their help. Anytime we have assist, need assistance or have questions about how we're going to get networking somewhere, they're, they're immediately to help us, so I really think that they should get kudos for that. Facilities also, our new election equipment came in, and we were very fortunate to have the space all set up because facilities did it for us with as little money as possible, I have to say, too. They were very creative to get everything we needed done for cheap. <laughs> and then HR also, this last week we even told them how this plan's going to impact. We won't have as many volunteers. We'll need to hire extra hire. And lo and behold, a week later we have um, an extra hire posting open for 18 positions. So thank you to everyone who's helped us. Um, Ms. Cano, 
your public meetings where will they be held? they will be at the chesboro room for the so the first four will be held at the chesboro room so and the library. are there any plans to hold them in other parts of the county we initially will not hold them we'll hold them here but once we start moving and we're uh, advertising how this election plan will change we'll have different meetings around the county explaining the difference but with that's the election be and showing the new equipment but that will be after the public comment periods close though correct? it will be after the public comments periods close I am happy to go anywhere anyone invites me if somebody wants to host a meeting and invite me to talk about it I will show up um, but we don't have the resources initially we already have <laughs> our money pretty well put away for where we need to spend it um, but if somebody wants to host a meeting and invite me to come talk about it I'm more than happy to attend any meeting got it thank you thank you <laughs> So no further staff announcements. I have one quick announcement to make. Uh, we will be having a board meeting on the 20th. We had discussed not having one. Uh, we'll have one agenda item that has to do with the um, sheriff's background check for cannabis. It'll be the first of two readings, so we're going to have two bites of this apple. Uh, a large part of the reason for the timing of this meeting is to, in order to get the process going so that we could get these uh, pieces behind us so I want to make that announcement to the board and the public um, there'll be an announcement coming out officially with the agenda items but there'll be a meeting on the 20th so we will move on to we have one announcement we have a uh, Shannon our archivist Madam Clerk so item five is from the clerk recorder to receive a presentation from the county archivist regarding historical photographs on display in the board chambers I'd like to welcome you all up to stands and if anybody has not visited our archives you need to they're amazing good morning Rebecca Turner clerk recorder as you've noticed we have new pictures in the um, the board chambers today and Shannon is going to discuss each picture briefly and how it was selected and the events involved and then she's also going to briefly talk about some of the interesting things that she does as archivist hi good morning so I guess we'll just go around the room um, the first photo over here is Parrots Ferry so before uh, large bridges were built we had to be able to cross rivers and so this ferry operated where around where Parrots Ferry Bridge currently is um, these ferries were privately owned and operated but they were um, with permission from uh, the Board of Supervisors who had set fees for passengers so the fees would vary depending on if it was a single rider whether it was a team uh, and weight and that was approved and set by um, the Board of Supervisors um, this actual ferry here um, was started by Mr. Parrott hence the name Parrott's Ferry there was had nothing to do with birds so Thomas Parrott purchased this ferry in 1871 so the ferry was already operating uh, much earlier than that the next photo you see also has to do with the importance of water in the county uh, this is uh, the Utica ditch the Utica ditch brought water down from upper highway 4 corridor down to um, Murphy's and Angel's camp and this is the ditch tender it was a position that the Utica company would hire a person to tend the ditch to keep it clear of debris uh, and this is him with his family enjoying a day uh, walking along the ditch the next photo that you see in the back here this is the roundhouse at the Murphy's Rancheria this uh, the northern Miwok uh, of course were the first uh, people here they are our indigenous they came about 1,000 to 500 years ago this uh, was above the Ora Plata mine off of Sheep Ranch Road above Murphy's it no longer exists it's not there but you can drive out Sheep Ranch Road and see uh, the old mine and look up on the ridge and that is where this um, rancheria would have been uh, in the back this is down uh, in the Copperopolis area. This is a uh, hauling ore from the mines. And this is, of course, a little bit later so that there is this um, railroad. So this is more like turn of the century. Um, and this is transporting the ore from Telegraph City, which is kind of our local ghost town now, <laughs> uh, to Milton, where the uh, train terminus was for the county um, to take the ore 
further down. Uh, the next one here, this is the um, manual mill. This is up near Arnold on San Antonio Creek. Uh, logs were very important in the early history of the county. They were used not only for constructing towns, uh, but they were also used for building flumes and, and uh, supporting ditches. And later they were used as timbers for the underground mines that began around the 1880s. And so in order to get the mills from the location, they would use the waterways and push the log to the mill to... Um, to cut it down for lumber. Uh, the last photo here um, kind of shows the importance of agriculture in the region. This is uh, the Gardella Winery. This is right outside of McCullamy Hill. Um, we had a few large wineries in the early history, uh, but mostly it was cattle ranching and orchards down in the uh, Burson and Wallace area. Um, vineyards have made a resurgence in the middle of the 1900s, 1950, 60, we saw sort of a resurgence. Uh, but this is one of our earliest ones, uh, the Gardella family who purchased this vineyard. So all of these photos come from the county archives. Uh, the county archives houses uh, basically public records, the county's public historic records. Our records date from about 1851 through about 1940. In addition to the public records, uh, families have donated items to the county. Uh, so we have a large collection of donated items where most of these photographs came from. Uh, they are county property once they're donated to the archive. Uh, the archives focus on conservation of their collections. Uh, we also have a research room that's open 15 hours a week. Uh, we've done some pretty fun research here lately. Uh, I worked on a History Channel documentary on D.B. Cooper. Um, there was a local man in, uh, who lived in Valley Springs who the FBI suspected of being D.B. Cooper, and so the History Channel did a very large documentary um, and used the archives to research this man and his time in Valley Springs. The archives have all, has also been recently used uh, for the federal litigation uh, on the Sheep Ranch Rancheria which uh, is governed by the, um, it's not the BIA anymore, it is the Department of the Interior, uh, who determines uh, tribal status. And so there have been some issues going on there, and um, they have had lawyers come in to try to trace the genealogy of our sheep ranch tribe. There have also been two books on the Calaveras County brands published using the records from the county archives, the cattle brands. Um, there were also, of course, horse brands and other things there. So we have two history books there. Uh, the photographs are really popular. So there have been multiple books published using the photographs from the archives, including uh, Northern Calaveras County, Around Murphy's, Angels and Copperopolis, The Big Trees, and Wineries of the Gold Country have all used the resources at the archives. So uh, it is open to the public. I encourage people to come in, check out our resources. If you have things that you th would like to preserve and you're not sure that your family is very happy or, or about keeping these things around, the archives is one of the perfect places to sort of donate them to make sure that others can enjoy your family histories uh, or your business histories or anything like that. Any questions? Anything to add on these wonderful photos that turned out very nice? <laughs> I would. <coughs> How are you funded? We are, uh, we are a, an office of the clerk recorder, so I am funded through the clerk recorder. Okay. I would. It's a mandated department, however. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, like to, I would like to thank you. I'd also like to thank the clerk recorder for helping bankroll uh, this mm -hmm. art display of our Calaveras history. I think it shows our diverse diverse industrial and people. I would encourage you all to take a close look at these photos. There's some interesting details as you go through and look at the people and what they're doing or where they're picnicking in some of these photos. And I encourage everybody to go down to the archives. Although it's in Supervisor Toffinelli's district, I have to admit, I, I there's nothing I enjoy more than digging through those old records. And I think it's one of the most complete histories in the state of California, as I understand. It, it is. Uh, we have researchers come in from New York, 
Uh, and back east, anybody who wants to do any gold rush history, it is one of the most complete collections in the state of California on early gold rush documents. Thank you, Supervisor Mills. And, and just an interesting point too is, is that for those families that have a lot of, um, of these old documents, you would be very interested in taking them I would be, uh, yes. Because I'm sure that as these families age and they don't see the importance of them to keep them in the family, but it's important to the history of the county mm -hmm. that, that we make that uh, available to them to be able to come to you and, mm -hmm. and sort through uh, what might be very critical in, in uh, documenting our history. Yeah, so once something is donated, it, it is a uh, public record and is open to come and, and you can reproduce it and all of those things. So it is still available. It is just... Um, conserved in an area where you don't have to worry about it um, disappearing or being separated. Well, I hope that at some point this board takes up uh, the facilities and we can figure out how to keep our treasure safe. Yes. But thank you very, very thank much. You. Appreciate it. And thank you, Rebecca, for helping make this happen. And Madam Clerk, thank you for your work on this as well. Both of you. Thank you. We'll move on to general comment, public comment. General public comment. Any item of interest to the public that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board and is not posted on the consent or regular agendas may be addressed during the public comment period. California law prohibits the board from taking action on any matter which is not posted on the agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the Board of Supervisors. If public comment is completed before the 30-minute allotted time period, the board may immediately move to the next order of business. If public comment is not completed during the allotted time period, it will be continued as the last item of business in order to provide an opportunity for the remainder of comments to be heard. Justin will be talking to you in a moment, and he has some very interesting things to tell you. Um, there, there's a lot I want to talk to you about, but I have to narrow it down. I just spent uh, a week up in the Humboldt County seeing how regulation works, and um, and I wanted to talk to you about the general plan as well and some problems I see there and uh, and how the meeting was uh, was run but not negative um, but uh, but I want to talk to you something about something that uh, happened this week in a conversation I had and um, the conversation uh, was with my significant other and her uh, female friends as well as um, uh, some uh, people, uh, gay and lesbians, and we're just sitting around and having this conversation. And it came to race. The conversation came to race. And, uh, and I, told, I told her, you'd never realize that when you want to argue with me in a public place, I either walk away or don't, uh, don't converse with you. Um, and she said, no, what, what was that about? I told her, you never, as a, as a person of color, you never argue with a blonde, blue-eyed uh, younger woman or woman at all. Because immediately, uh, people will come to her defense. And oftentimes, in a very uh, rough manner. So... Uh, she was surprised about that, and some of the other ladies who had dated uh, people of color said, "No, that that's true. And I've had conversations with my uh, with my significant other or boyfriend about that, and it, it, it is true." So, uh, if you remember back in uh, back last year, uh, I uh, gave uh, Megan a perform your county council performance review, and in that review, I. Um, uh, I stated her work experience, her education, uh, and uh, later on in that meeting, uh, former supervisor Steve Walensky came up here, violated, uh, violated the board's policies by talking about something that wasn't on the, it wasn't uh, that item on the agenda, and came to her defense saying that I had leveled an attack against her. Now, this is off the, uh, yeah, uh, I leveled an attack against her. Well, when you're using facts, it's not an attack. Um, and, uh, and then that opened the door to basically hate speech later on by, uh, by members of the public that came before you at a later time 
and just screamed my name and screamed and uh, the bulletin boards were open with uh, racial epithets. It's, that is racism. That's racism. That's true racism. Thank you very much. Ms. Newman? Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Justin Buller. I'm an attorney with uh, experience in the cannabis industry, and uh, I've worked with cannabis business operators as well as the city of San Jose city attorney's office where I handled marijuana enforcement actions and shut down illegal cannabis businesses. I have recently moved from San Jose to Valley Springs with my wife and we hope to raise our family here in Calaveras County. I believe that my experience working in the legal market as well as on the enforcement and shutting down these businesses could be a great asset the county can utilize in drafting these new ordinances and ultimately enforcing them. So I have corresponded actually with you, Moretta Calloway, and I greatly appreciate your uh, timely responses. I've also met with uh, Ethan Turner of the County Council's office to kind of just get a, more of a feel for how Calaveras County has been dealing with cannabis issues uh, since I am new here. And uh, I'm here today to offer you my services to help not only draft these regulations, but also ultimately enforce them in any capacity that the board or the County Council sees fit. I'm a true believer in this industry and after seeing what happened in the Bay Area and in San Jose where big businesses have become rampantly infiltrating local small grassroots businesses, I want to ensure that Calaveras County gets the local and community support and that the benefit of this cannabis program goes to locals and to the community and not to big business. I know that the initial draft of the regulations are set to come out very soon and I would love to engage in discussions with county staff board members, um, whenever it's convenient, I'm here to work hard and long hours for you guys because I know that this could be a great economic stimulus for this county if it is done right. This is a huge opportunity and I know that's going to take a lot of time, effort, and patience. I know that there's contention among community members about whether or not they even want this industry here. I want to make sure that everybody's heard, listened to, and that the community benefit of cannabis is felt and stays in Calaveras County and not into the pockets of bigger corporations. I hope to meet with you all and talk more in the future, and um, I'm here open as a resource. Again, my name is Justin Buller, and uh, I will reach out more again to you as well, Megan. I think I sent you an email. but. Um, and I, like I said, I really just want to be involved in this process because I want to be a local. I want to stay here. I want to raise my family. We are having our first baby in March. And uh, I think that there's a great opportunity here to raise up this county. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good morning, Bonnie. Uh, good morning. My name is Bonnie Newman. I'm from Double Springs. And... Um, as if you didn't know, Calaveras County sponsors a program called In-Home Supportive Services. Um, although it is a county program, somehow all the counties were able to wiggle their way out of responsibility by creating a program called the Public Authority, which makes a firewall between you and the 330 workers who have not received a pay raise in nine years and because of the incompetence of our union, we're not expecting to receive one because our union is not stepping up and supporting the workers, the 330 people who are now working at minimum wage. Nine years ago, we were making $2 an hour above the minimum wage. Today, we're just minimum wage workers. And although there's something on the agenda later, I want to focus on the wages that the home care workers have not been receiving for nine years. Uh, the average worker works about 120 hours a month. That's about twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a month. And it's not a living wage if you have a, a family to support, if you have a mortgage to pay, if you've got bills like utilities, it doesn't go very far, $1,300. Um, fortunately, um, we have a pretty low standard of living in Calaveras, so our 
bills are not as high as they would be, let's say, in the Bay Area or even in Stockton. So we're able to eke out a living by cutting back, sacrificing, and denying ourselves in some respect some of the benefits that most county workers have. Most workers in IHSS do not have health insurance. Uh, most workers are, will never be able to enjoy overtime or um, any of the other benefits, uh, sick leave, vacation time. So I just want to remind you that the IHSS home care workers are here in this county, 330 of them. They provide services for about 360 blind, disabled, and frail individuals, seniors also, um, who are not able to care for themselves. So thank you for your time. Do not forget about the IHSS workers in the future. Thank you very much, thank Bonnie. You. Ms. Corda? When I was a home care worker, um, so I would work like two days back to back. And I did better that way. Um, or I lived in a li as a live-in person. And um, that was, you, it meant you were um, dealing with a whole lot of different people. And um, from home care nurses to uh, your fellow employees, and um, it's a very uh, exhausting, um, stressful job because of all the people you're dealing with. And uh, you're the last person on the totem pole. And um, so I, I really give a hand to the people that are willing to do that kind of work. Um, and... Um, there's a lot more people coming to do, you know, that are going to need it, including me. <laughs> but anyway, I, I came to talk about Ferguson, Missouri, and how it became known to me from the news that a young black man got shot by a cop. The aftermath was a worldwide news of a community imploding on itself. Caught in the drama was the black captain of the police. He attended the young man's funeral. He said at the funeral that he was sorry the parents of the young man had, that of the young man that they had lost their son. The parents asked to see him after the funeral. He again told the parents he was sorry that they had lost their son though the parents at this time said nothing. When the court exonerated the cop that shot the suspect, Ferguson again broke down in chaos and violence. Buildings burned, windows broken, and all that violent behavior. During all this, the black captain continued to reach out to the family of the young man and the community. As time passed and much effort was focused on the healing of the community. So the black captain was at a sports bar with his daughter and her boyfriend. The black captain noticed four young white men in camo uh, and it ended up that he told his daughter and her, her boyfriend to leave. And Thank you very oh. much. Any other public comment? Seeing none, we will move on to the consent item. <coughs> agenda, excuse me. Consent agenda items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by the board at one time without discussion. Any board member, staff member, or interested party may request removal of an item from the consent agenda for later discussion. Any board members wish to pull an item? Supervisor Stopper? Number 11. Supervisor Stopper? Uh, number 13. 
Supervisor Calloway? 21. Any staff, any staff wish to pull an item? Public. Bonnie? Number 11, number 15. Number 11, number 15. All right, mark the stay chair. Mark the stay. I didn't pull anything. Hey, I got you to this. You can make the motion to move the remainder. I still move the remainder. I second. Second by Mr. Stapanelli. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5 0. Okay. Um, 11, I think was item 11 is from code compliance to approve the contract with dirty works for abatement services in the amount not to exceed $150,000 for a term of two years from the date of approval. Supervisor Stopper. The, this has been, been before us multiple times, but I just saw. Uh, when we move forward with these things, I just have one question. Section, section 7, fiscal considerations. The parties to this agreement recognize and acknowledge that the county is a political subdivision of the state of California. As such, Calabras County is subject to the provisions of Article 16, Section 8 of the California Constitution and other similar fiscal and procurement laws and regulations and may not expend funds for products, equipment, or services not budgeted in a given fiscal year. So th this is a consideration when we move forward on anything in the future when we're uh, contracting out and we're working on anything, correct? Correct. Thank you. That's Thank all. Thank you, sir. Ms. Newman, you had a question? Yes, I had a question and I had a comment. Um, the funding source, the $150,000, is that coming out of the general fund? Does anyone give a, know? Why don't you give us all your questions and then we'll give okay. you... Okay. Well, that's my that question. Was... My response may depend on what your response is. But I would also like to say that um, this Dirty Works is a program designed to destroy the marijuana farms and plants. If an alternative option were made available where the county or whoever is paying the $150,000 were to um, consider an option, uh, then maybe that money could be saved by the county and the home care workers could finally get a raise. Um, my idea is for the people that are mostly concerned about abatement services, and we're talking about illegal grows, and I guess that's all there is in Calaveras right now, that there are labs in, Calaver in California that I'm not sure they're willing to, but could probably be induced to pay the county for the disposal of the cannabis. Um, the cannabis is the money. That's the big money. Um, cannabis can be processed and used to create medicine, um, as we've learned over the past few years. And I would like to see some effort made to find an alternative to the destruction of the money, the plants, the cannabis, rather than just um, destroying it at a cost of $150,000 from some taxpayer somewhere. And I hope it's not Calaveras County General Fund that's paying this money, but I'm afraid it might be. That's why I'm making a comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Campbell, do you want to talk about the source of the funds? The, the larger issue, Bonnie, um, the board has not taken up or considered any alternates to destruction at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Code compliance as a department is partially funded through the general fund and also through cost recovery um, and partially through the building department funds as well. Um, every abatement we do, we are able to recover those costs. Thank you. Is there any 
in their entirety? Uh, potentially. Potentially. But it depends. It's case to case. Supervisor Mills? Yes, and Sabrina, this is not just simply for marijuana eradication. I very much appreciate it. Got immediate feedback on the work that was done on the uh, abatement on Rock Creek. Thank you. Yes, this yeah. is all encompassing any sort of abatement, cannabis or otherwise. So, so yes. it isn't just for cannabis. This no. this covers the full spectrum of 8.06. Correct. And there is a lot of work outside of the realm of cannabis there is? that you do. Yes. So I don't, I don't want a misunderstanding here that that's all you do. No. Um, to the tune of 400 active cases, non-cannabis. Thank you. And that's that's my point. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Um, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing the way around, that was questions from Bonnie. So I'll do public comment. Seeing no public comment, I'll bring it back to the board. Is there a motion? So moved, sir. I'll moved, second. Moved by Supervisor Stopper, second by Supervisor Toffinelli. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. 13, Item 13 is from Public Works. One, to award an RFP 19-0920-40-913 for the construction of the Murphy's Drive Disaster Recovery Project. Two, authorize the board chair to execute an agreement with KW Emerson Incorporated for construction of the Murphy's Drive Repair Replacement Project in an amount not to exceed $297,815 for a period of August 1st, 2019 through December 31st, 2019, and authorize the auditor controller to process a budget general fund reserve transfer in the amount of $448,000 to fully fund this project until such time as the state and federal reimbursement may be received, requiring a four-fifths affirmative vote of the Board of Supervisors. Questions? Yes, I pulled this um, item because one, um, I don't think any time an item is before us that requires a four-fifths vote that uh, takes money from our either contingency or reserves should be on consent. I believe that should be um, on our regular agenda. The other reason I pulled this is um, this is the second time in within 45 days that we passed a preliminary budget we're asking to take money out of either reserve or contingencies for an item i believe this item should be coming before us should have came before us either at preliminary or at final budget along with any other items that were missed at preliminary for us to put back up on the board for us to go through um, I also want to say that I do um, support this project. I have from the be very beginning. Um, I just disagree with how we're looking to uh, fund it at this time. Uh, again, I believe it should be coming back to us at final budget with any other expenditures um, that we need to look at in order to um, finalize our final budget. Uh, there's no time frame here and when this money will be coming back to us from FEMA, there's no guarantee from that we will be receiving money from FEMA or the state. I know we are working with them. I'm very well aware of that. But, but again, it may be years before we see this money, and we're pulling it out of our reserves at this time. So uh, that's the reason I pulled it. I will not support it. I know Josh wants to speak a little bit about it, so I'll turn it over to him to let him speak. This is also a budget item, so perhaps, uh, Al, do you want to talk about the transfer? Uh, the, the background on it is less about the transfer and more about the effort that went into the item leading up to this. The auditor's office and Josh's office met and reviewed this project in advance. This is a strategy to bring the project forward. Um, we fully intend to submit for reimbursement until we complete a project and close it out we can't get the the funds back from from oes or fema so in order to complete the project and get any reimbursement we have to move it forward and i, I know that's not what supervisor toffinelli is contesting but um, we have kept the request current with fema they're in the loop on the project and it's the way to move it forward uh, based on our work with the auditor's office and public works 
Josh, do you want to add anything? Sure. So I'm going to pass this around so there's some more sheet bold items on the project. I also have enough copies for the public for anyone who's interested. Um, and so, uh, really quick again, my name is Joshua Pack. I'm your Director of Public Works and Transportation. Uh, I'll leave these over here for anyone who may be interested. And so, uh, Rebecca Callender, Auditor and Controller, is here to talk about the strategy on this. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these bullet items in the interest of time. Uh, this is a project that's in our capital improvement program. It's a project that was affected by the 2019 winter storm or by the 2017 winter storms. Um, the culvert washed out. It's been gone for now two and a half years. Um, the original budget that was approved in January, and again, an interim was before we had the actual construction cost, so there wasn't uh, an error in the interim budget. Um, it was just the fact that we didn't know what the actual costs were until we bid the project. So for five, uh, we have five FEMA jobs remaining um, uh, that we plan to deliver within the next calendar year. Um, they fall, um, uh, you're fairly familiar with them. We've brought them back to you a number of times. Uh, generally speaking, FEMA projects fall under two distinctions. Um, we either, if they're projects that remain on the scope, we continue to move forward. Um, the initial estimates are estimates only. Um, the final costs are generally fe fully reimbursable through FEMA as long as we're, um, uh, we're making repairs in kind. Uh, so you can't take FEMA money and take a culvert a damage and put a new bridge. Uh, FEMA is very aware of agencies who make attempts to better uh, using federal dollars to make betterments. These projects are not doing that. They're holding uh, true to the core of replacing in kind. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're replacing the original culvert with the exact same size culvert. We are doing some additional armoring and repairing to make sure those repairs stay in place. Um, uh, that is re uh, reimbursable, uh, likely reimbursable through FEMA. So um, uh, again, um, uh, this is in kind. That was designed specifically that way also to expedite the delivery project. Um, we have two other projects that are falling under that purview where we're staying within the project scope. Um, we have two that uh, after analysis and design, um, those projects are outside the scope. So we've submitted reimbursement requests and um, additional documentation to FEMA. We will not move forward with construction until we have approval from FEMA with those revised scopes. And that's for the Gwyn Mine and Canyon View projects. So uh, we are following the process. We've been keeping FEMA and Cal OES in the loop uh, for the entire duration of this. Every indication is that we've had for, with them is that they're, um, these are reimbursable expenses. We do plan to get that. Um, now, this project's a little different from other projects. Most all, all federal grants that we receive, bridges, et cetera, are in our reimbursable process. Um, we, we, we pay the bill up front. We submit a reimbursement request to the federal government or to the state. Uh, they reimburse that. Uh, the issue with FEMA, uh, it's different from the other ones, is uh, the traditional grants take 30 to 45 days or so to reimburse. FEMA is notoriously slow, as Supervisor Tofanelli uh, outlined. Uh, it can take months. Uh, it could take a year or more sometimes to get reimbursement. The reimbursement does occur uh, under most cases. And again, we are aggressively pursuing every cent of this to get reimbursed. Um, however, um, it does take some time. And the, gen and the uh, road fund just does not have the liquidity uh, in order to absorb that sort of long-term um, long um, uh, cost. Uh, and so with that said, there are some discussions regarding general fund reserves. Um, our auditor controller has um, offered um, uh, graciously to speak more on that, and I'd ask her to come up if she's available. So uh, in 2015, when Butte Fire came through, that was our first federal declaration that Calaveras had experienced. And so uh, trying to determine what the actual exposure points were going to be from um, a resources standpoint took time to really figure out. Part of the discussion before our Butte Fire, which was after Tuolumne County's Rim Fire, was we really need to get that general reserve up because we are potentially going to have a cash flow issue right because we don't know how long it's going to take to get reimbursed for these expenditures that we're going to incur so as time has gone on i can tell you it takes a really long time uh it, it can take years and so what we have been doing since 2015 is we have been taking the expenditures and budgeting the expenditures and then uh, budgeting the revenues like we would any other grant program Right? So you are budgeting your expenditures and then you're budgeting your revenue at the same time with the understanding is as you incur those expenses, you can make a claim, you get the revenue back and it all will match itself. 
um, that isn't what's happening. And so what is occurring year after year after year is we're incurring the expenses, we're making the claim, we might get um, a portion of the expenditures back, but only up to what the original uh, project approval amount is. So a perfect example is Murphy's Drive. Right now, the, um, the notice of obligation under the grant is $149,000. Well, you can tell from the board packet today, it's not gonna cost $149,000. So what would happen is we, you know, we're actively trying to um, expand the scope of work with Cal OES and FEMA. And then at the same time that the scope of work is, is getting modified, we're trying to also have them expand the dollar amount, right? To change it from 149,000 to, what was that, 400 and, yeah, 450,000. Sometimes they will, and sometimes they won't. So what happens is they'll say, but don't worry about it. We will uh, we'll make you whole at the closeout of the project will make you whole at the closeout of the grant. So right now, if you look at Butte Fire, 2017 winter storm, now we're coming into 2018 winter storm, you look at all of them, we have about $3.2 million in outstanding reimbursements that we will not see that money come in until either the closeout of the project or the closeout of the grant. Um, the closeout of the project has a shorter window of time but to give you an example, uh, on the debris trees, the, the hazardous um, burn trees from Butte Fire, we did the first phase of the project, there's another 1,800 trees to remove. We can't remove the second uh, phase two trees until that gets through environmental. It can take 18 to 24 months to get through environmental before you can start removing those trees. Once you do that, then uh, you have the actual physical removal of the tree, the felling of the tree. So how long is that project gonna take? So if, if we can't get the reimbursement until the, either the, um, the, the dollar amount, because right now I think it's 12.5 about what they've approved, we've already spent the 12.5. 12 so any dollar we spend now, um, we're, we are waiting, right? So we're still working with them to, to try to add additional dollars to that project. If they won't, um, if they can't add additional uh, dollars to that project, we'll get reimbursed at the close of the project, which again, that could be two years from now. Um, in the case of the match, uh, we've talked about this repeatedly, where the debris and the emergency protective measures, uh, normally there would be a six and a quarter percent match, uh, local match to the county, except on debris and uh, emergency protective measures. We won't have to pay the six and a quarter. However, we will not get the six and a quarter until the close of the grant. So think about Butte Fire. How long is it gonna take us to close out that grant? Well, if the project for the ash, or the, sorry, the debris trees, the, uh, the burn trees is gonna take another two years, we can't close that grant until two to three years. So sorry. it could take two to, two to three years before we're gonna see that six and a quarter percent reimbursement back to the county. Not to mention the fact that the size of the project is so big, they withhold a 10% retainage. The state does and, and FEMA does. So 10%, no matter what, is getting retained. And they won't release that money until the close of the project. So there's all these windows that we're kind of uh, fighting with. And so what has historically been happening where we have been utilizing cash carry, we've been utilizing current year operating revenue, we have reached the point where we just can't afford that anymore. So for the first time, what, what my recommendation is, is we actually have to open up the reserve and we're gonna have to utilize the reserve for the purpose of what that reserve is for. And with the understanding that a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, when that revenue comes in, it will repay the reserve. But the reality is you're going to probably have to pull $3 million out of the general reserve 
Otherwise, we are exposing the general fund to a huge um, void. And that's not really fair to the general fund in terms of um, putting strain on its operating resources because these aren't operating expenditures. These are disaster recovery uh, projects that have to occur. And we are going to get the revenue. It's just we're not going to get the revenue tomorrow. We're going to get it at some point in time, whether it be um, when uh, Cal OES and FEMA approve the change in scope, approve the change in dollar amount, or at the close of the project, or at the close of the grant. And that could happen uh, in six months, a year, two years, five years from now. So it really does mean that historically, since I've been here, um, back to 2006, we've never hit the general reserve. It's been there. Uh, we've added money to it. We've utilized it from a pooled cash uh, perspective in terms of cash flow, but we've never drawn from it. And this will be the first time that you know I'm really advocating we're going to have to draw from the from the reserve. Um, it's a little uh, uncomfortable because we're hitting fire season. And so, you know, if we pull $3 million out of the General Reserve, then that's only going to leave us, you know, I think it's 5.2 right now. So we'd, we'd be still there with a little over two. But um, I think that's where we're at. And so, um, you know, the, the, the issue at this point is just timing. So if we wait until final budget for this, that means that he can't, um, he, he can't move forward on that project. So between now and, uh, you know, the final budget would be adopted the end of September. So he wouldn't be able to start doing any form of work until October, November, December. So if it doesn't get approved till final. So I think it's just trying to, you know, get ahead of it with the understanding of what we completely acknowledge. I mean, there's been an absolute delay in, in getting this stuff forward. So I'm very appreciative of, of Mr. Pack because he's done, I think, a really good job at trying to um, identify these projects, getting updated information, and, and pushing them forward. Um, I don't disagree. It would have been ideal to have this included as part of recommended but just things don't always align the way that they need to. So um, regardless of what happens, I think that uh, you're right. It, it, it does, you do need to see everything in front of you, but I think at the end of the day, there's going to have to be a pull from the reserve. Uh, there's not any other way to shore up the budget without it overall. Thank you. Any other questions for Supervisor Tufnell? Uh, Rebecca, 13 years you've been here. Historically, um, at midterm, do we not tap in a huge amount to contingencies? Um, Last year, I think it was close to a million dollars. Yeah. Yes, and historically, that's been right now because we've tapped in the reserve already this year. With within, it was within 30 days of the prelim, we were already tapping into it. Uh, well, for whatever reason, and to, not to reserve contingency, yeah, contingency but my yeah. point is, historically at midterm, we're deluged on items that need to be addressed. So if we completely take all the money out of contingency, we have to replace it with reserve. That's the, why reserve is there. You're right for emergencies, but this, this project is now three years old. Um, at what point does it not become an emergency? And again, I've been on this project and aware of this project and pushing this project from the beginning back in 2017. Um, I just feel at this time, and I understand what you're saying about delaying the project, but we don't know, nothing's been presented to this board coming into final, whether we're gonna have to tap into contingencies at that time on final, where we stand money-wise, anything. I just don't think it's proper at this time to, to, to tap into reserve before we have all that information final for in front of us so we know where we're at and going into midterm what's left of our contingencies that we may have to be pulling out of reserve to restock that. 
and yes you use it for cash flow you have some different areas now available to you which if you didn't the pg and e monies or other things you would be going into reserve to keep the money flowing as in past years and so i just think it's it's a little contentious here to start 45 days into a preliminary budget tapping in to reserve that amount uh, again i'm not against the project i've been behind it from the beginning but um, I, I just think this conversation needs to be had um, either with a different funding source or waiting till final budget so we know what all the numbers are uh, before we make this decision. So um, also one other point with FEMA, and you brought this up to us uh, when we were discussing the PG&E settlement funds and how to distribute them, um, and you won't be around. Um, we had to take a million dollars out of that settlement funds to satisfy FEMA at a future date because we may not be getting that money back with the way we did things. And um, it's so, a, it's so, a, yeah. so, so I'm just pointing out, mm -hmm. nothing is in stone. Even the nope. Butte fire that you said, if we didn't do everything right or we don't do everything on these projects completely to satisfy fema no matter what they're saying now when it comes time for them to write the check and distribute the money they may say something different so and and this is a perfect um this this is exactly why they on a on the project uh for the the burn trees which has been thus far about 12 million dollars mm -hmm. this is exactly why they retain 10 percent because they're assuming there is going to be something uh, that they don't like. And so they don't want to be out that money. They'd rather us be out that money. So that's why that 10% exists on a large project like that. So, um, you know, I will say I've, I've uh, prior to me leaving, I've, I've tried to go through all of the disaster budgets and anything that is, uh, you know, that I see is going to be a critical issue, a material issue. Um, I have given that to the CAO in his office. Um, yeah, if we don't, uh, for as part of final, if we don't pull money out of the reserve, you will have no contingent. Just with those, just with those uh, yep. material adjustments that need to be made, you Thank will you. have zero contingent. Yep. So um, right. that's that, and that is all related to these disaster recovery budgets. And it's just they don't operate in the same way that any other grant that we have. Usually, we can align the expenses and the revenue. These are ones you just can't. Supervisor Mills. Thank you. Um, I think this has been a frustration with this Murphy's Drag project. And uh, although it is a safety issue, I think that this board probably needs to have a separate discussion at some point in the near future about p policy. And policy is, is do we make uh, substantial budget adjustments after prelim and, and then not have that, that full conversation? In other words, what we should be able to anticipate as best possible in the preliminary budget as to what could be out there. And my concern is what else might be there. And uh, those surprises have yet to be revealed, but may require additional budget. I just assume not have any budget adjustments between prelim and final. Then when we go to final, we can have those conversations and, and have a, a real clear settling at that point, rather than try to pull these pieces up and together. Um, I, I'm really having some concerns about the words likely reimbursable and also um, the potential disallowances that may come out of all of this and that uh, even the million dollars that we've set aside might not be en enough. So I just want to be sure that at some point we have a separate discussion as, as a policy matter of how we're going to handle the time windows between the preliminary budget and the final budget and what we would consider as as important and necessary to put in there and what really needs to s just hang on until we get to September and then we can make those decisions uh, rather than try to make a whole series of decisions in the interim and then look back at September and go, oh my, what did we do? Because there could be things that still could shuffle and change and I just I, I just have a real problem with trying to do it in this particular way 
especially with budget adjustments. Supervisor Keller? I think we're forgetting the constituency here that have been before the prior board and this board on this issue and it was supported and thanks to the current public works this project has finally come to fruition and there had been no comment from this board at any time that we shouldn't be looking at the winter storm damage the concerns of Supervisor Tofanelli I generally would support that um, and I agree with Supervisor Mills this should be a discussion but it's not a discussion for this project we are locked into when how late we can work in the creek and if we wait until final budget we don't know where the contractor is going to be on his workload he is committing to this project and for this time frame and if we're now saying we're well, what you're going to have to wait another couple of months that isn't fair to him he might not be available at that time we're going to miss the the deadline for being able to get out of the creek we know we're going to have to pull from reserves whether we do it now or whether we do it in September the issue is still before us and we have other winter storm projects that's part of why we have a reserve or part of why we have a contingency this hasn't been easy for the county since the Butte fire I understand that but I think by waiting um, we're going to be pushing this project out another year or at least until the spring and then the price of it also could change and that means renegotiating with FEMA again I think it would be a disservice to the uh, community who's been waiting and um, to a commitment that the prior board and this board has made to that community that we will fix the Murphy's Drive and so I encourage my colleagues to support the items that's before us thank you is there any public comment on this item seeing none I'll bring I'm, I'm sorry is it going to be two years to do an environmental and something else study before it can be done because that's what I understood I didn't I guess I got my wires crossed but if there's so many rules and regulations that it puts a project down the line so far that's the trouble with so much governmental regulation you can't plan you can't do anything spontaneously it's horrible and that's why I don't believe in all these rules and regulations and onerous oversight Ms. Newman. Um, when we were talking about shuffling around money I just have a question about money how much is in the general fund how much is in reserve how much is in contingencies and how much is in teeter and are there any other funding sources that the county has access to that are not general reserve contingency or teeter thank you any other further public comment seeing that I'll bring it back to the board for the discussion or a motion Supervisor Mills your light is on chair I'd be willing to support this simply because it is a public safety issue with a clear understanding that this board will come back and maybe get an understanding of the budget act and and to establish a discussion around the policies of how we deal with transfers between the preliminary and the final budget if that's not going to happen then I won't support it we can discuss anything we want at budget time um, I mean there's nothing stopping us I 
I guess the first item would be um, to authorize the auditor controller to process the uh, general fund reserve transfer in the amount of $448,000 to fund the project. If there is no support to do that, then we do not have a project to approve. So I move item the portion to authorize the transfer. I have a couple questions. We have a motion um, on the table. I think I, have to, I think court and process. You know, I have discretion. Carry your question. Thank you. Um, I believe there's other funding sources that can become before us um, besides going into reserve. Um, first question I have of you, Josh, is if if this is a go and go forward, um, Fish and Wildlife will not allow them in the creek after October 5th, just like Cosgrove Creek after October 15th or whatever it is, or before November 1st or, or something. It, is, there, is there a projected um, schedule of completion for this project if it starts September 1st? Yeah, uh, Supervisor Tofanelli, yeah, I believe there's a 30-day construction window for this, so um, you are correct. There's uh, the permits which we do have in hand. Those are approved by Fish and Wildlife uh, and the uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board. Uh, those permits allow October 15th. Um, there is a little bit of flexibility, depending on the seasons, to give another couple of weeks. Um, right now, with this current schedule, uh, assuming the boards approves it today, we have a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, the idea is, with if assuming the con con contractor starts sometime shortly after Labor Day, they should be complete right around October 15th. So, um, if this does get delayed until uh, final budget, um, we would not be able to deliver that project this construction season. So, given that information, and we're complete with the project, at that time we can then bill FEMA for the grant. Is that correct? That's correct. I see Rebecca saying yes to both of you saying yes. Yeah. So with that time frame, um, if we use money from somewhere other than general fund, we're looking at FEMA possibly paying us, giving us a check to pay us back sometime within nine months, 10 months, that time frame. So if we used money from another funding source for that period of time, other than reserve, because I have just some, some problems using reserve right now before final, um, not knowing where we're going because of a lot of other issues that are going on, um, that funding is going to be coming out of general fund to pay for. Um, if we use, we have, I know we have teeter and we're using teeter in this current budget but we've used teeter for for the same items and we've never completed during the year for the capital improvement projects and other projects we've always carried it over and I'm not sure at this point at least a million dollars of that is going to be expended this year this coming year within the time frame of what we could recover in money it's possible like we did the year before or the year before, we expended the money when Tim was here, and then we got it paid back, mm -hmm. and it was used again. Um, so I'm not sure that at this point it couldn't come out of teeter with the funding going back, being how short schedule and time frame this project is, and how quickly we can get it done to go back before we even tap into it. It may not be this year, those capital projects we see being coming to fruitation or even spending all of that funding. So I, I think there is other areas. I just concern about, again, and it's public safety, and I support this project, Marina knows, from the beginning I've supported this project, uh, and we're in scheduled meetings to, and sat in on meetings on it. Um, it. Again, is the general fund reserve not having final budget in front of us and those expenditures and then going into midterm, what's going to happen during the year. So I would propose, at least this time, because of the short project, that we, we use teeter funds, and then when the funds come in, 
we can replace them because I don't think we're going to expend all of those on the projects that we have currently. Um, so right now I think we have 3.4 uh, mm -hmm. is the budgeted transfer plus another uh, X amount uh, going into uh, capital improvement projects. So I think it's 5.4 million, something like that, coming out of Teeter for 1920. Um, 3.4 of that is stopgap because our uh, expenditures are higher than our uh, sources of revenue so um, there there is uh, some money in teeter there's not a lot if we take those uh, budgeted items into consideration um, so I mean we've we've borrowed historically we've borrowed against REM we've borrowed against teeter we've borrowed against um, all, all sorts of funding sources with the understanding that when the revenues came in that we would repay them so um, whether you use general reserve or teeter but you are already using um, over five million dollars of teeter in the 1920 budget uh, and, and again so a lot of this capital improvement projects uh, I, I know what you're saying about but I don't see in being sitting on that committee with Jack I don't see a whole lot of that money being spent within this fiscal year. Maybe, maybe some of it, a lot of it, but not to the, to the extent of what we have budgeted for it. Um, the other issue is um, you, historically, before you wouldn't tap into general fund reserve unless you had to, you used teeter to keep cash flow going. You haven't been doing that for the last three years You don't because you have other sources. Uh, um, we have been so every yeah. year we've been utilizing teeter as the stopgap for the budget and so if our at the end of the day a balanced budget has to come to the board by law so if your uh, sources of revenue don't equal your uses then teeter is the balancer right that's what has been happening so um, as opposed to we've just kind of parked the reserve over to the corner and uh, left it there. So that's that is correct. What is but as the happening. funding came in, you replaced it into teeter. As the funding came in, we didn't pull the trigger on some of the transfers. So if we had higher than anticipated sources of revenue, mm -hmm. then we didn't do the transfers right. in because if we could go back in time, we would have known that our property taxes would have been higher, or TOT was going to be higher, or whatever was going to be higher. So we wouldn't have uh, budgeted as much teeter. Uh, have you closed the books on last year? Um, we are going to be done by the end of the week. Uh, we are about $2 million higher in cash carry. Um, but when I tell you the, the adjustments that need to happen for 1920 um, and wiping out the contingent, that's inclusive of the $2 million higher in cash carry. Um, so it's it's a it's a I can promise you you're not going to get away from taking some of that money out of the reserve because there's not sufficient sources and teeter um, there is a limited period of time that we could utilize the rim funding um, it would be just from a short-term borrowing perspective because uh, rim can't be used um, directly to fund um, these expenditures, we could only do it for um, truly a borrowing situation, which we have done. Um, the last time we did it, I think the two of you may have been on the board. I know Marita was, um, and it was it had to do with uh, one of the CSAs. Um, so it was several years ago. It was the last time we did that. So um, it it it's just trying to isolate some a pot of money that whether it's restricted uh, or not uh, with the understanding that it would have to be paid back rim would absolutely have to be paid back the reserve is really at the discretion the reserve and teeter at the discretion of the board of supervisors thank you for the questions we have a motion on the floor uh, to move this item forward is there a second me, but the motion was the first item awarded no, the contract. Is that no? The motion was to authorize the transfer. If we did not authorize the transfer, there is no project. So, would you do you want to just do the whole item if that's the case, Maria? Well, there's three the 
transfer requires a four fifths vote. The contract is a majority, uh, is a majority vote. Okay, Mr. Chair, I will good with that. Let's. Um, there's a motion on the third item under public works, and if we if that passes, we'll take on item number one and two under that agenda item. Chair, to simplify second. this, would it be uh, better to amend the motion to make the transfer out of teeter rather than out of contingencies? Out of reserves, you mean? I guess I don't under, uh, what I'm hearing the auditor say, it doesn't make any difference whether we do teeter or whether we do reserves. We're going to be tapping into reserves anyway, and at final budget, we could transfer teeter into reserves. I mean, there are two pots that we could go for. But that's at final budget, and we can make the adjustments then if you want to go forward with this project. We don't have all the information in front of us. The books are not closed. We're not being presented with any final budget. So we can make the adjustments then. If, if, if we take money out of reserve, it will be for other things. But And she's saying we're going to have to take it to, to stabilize the budget. That's fine. But at this period of time, the unknown, how much and where and what, um, to, I'm trying to get to a point where I can support this at this time without going into reserve 45 days into a preliminary budget. So what difference is it going to reserve than going into teeter? The adjustments could be made at final budget anyway. Uh, and I have all the information in front of me at final budget. I'm trying to get you where you need to go, Marita. So you can say uh -huh. however you want to go, but I am I would support a motion pulling out um, teeter at this time. And when we go to final Ms. budget... Callen, what, I guess I'm not missing, I might be missing what um, you're saying. So, uh, what difference does it make? It, at this point, because we're in... Uh, uh, three, four, five, five declared emergencies that are continuing, we're in an emergency, no matter what day you pick. So you, have, as the board, have the authority to um, to tap into reserves because we're just in declared emergency uh, every day. Um, the moment that changes, then obviously, then that restricts your ability to touch the reserve. So at this point, it doesn't really matter uh, either way. Uh, if it was a different day and we didn't have a declared emergency, then yes, I would say uh, it would be a problem. But it, I, it doesn't really matter. And the bottom line is you can certainly make whatever adjustments you want to to teeter and to the reserve at final budget. Um, but I, I still would say doing what we need to do in order to fund the project so he can move forward um, immediately is probably the most important thing. So there's enough money in teeter to make the tr transfer from teeter versus the reserve. <coughs> That's fine. Do you want to I'll, um, I'll uh, amend the motion to do a transfer from uh, general fund reserve to teeter for I will, the $448,000. I will second that motion. Okay, we have a motion uh, by Supervisor Callaway and a second by Supervisor Toffinelli taking on the, under this item, Section 3, to affirm the transfer of funds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. We still have two items remaining. I'd on. like to move uh, awarding the contract for the construction of the Murphy's Drive uh, recovery project and at the same time um, execute an agreement with KW Emerson, a local company, for the construction of the Murphy's <coughs> Drive project. I will second. We have a motion by Supervisor Callaway for item one and two under that item, and a second by Supervisor Toffinelli. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. We are done with item 13. Um, can we take a break? Can we take a break? Yeah, we're going to, yeah, I don't think we're going to make it through consent before we uh, take a break. We're yeah, going to take, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. We're going to take a 15 minute break. Let's all return here at 10.
Welcome back to the Board of Supervisors meeting. We are on consent agenda, and I believe, Madam Clerk, we are on 15? Yes, we are. Item 15, the Board of Supervisors acting as the public authority to authorize the Board Chair to execute an agreement with Pan American Life Insurance Company for the provision of benefits for in-home supportive services providers in the amount not to exceed $230,000 for the period of September 1, 2019 through August 31, 2020. Ms. Newman, you had a question. I have several questions. Um, when the Board of Supervisors takes action as the public authority, aren't they supposed to adjourn as the board and convene as the public authority? Isn't that the common practice? Well, I just want to remind you, you've taken action twice this year and have not adjourned as the board and convened as the public authority. The two actions you've taken have just been like on the regular agenda. So I'm assuming if you do that, this anything today, you're going to adjourn and reconvene and all of that sort of thing. Then I'd like also like to say that um, you're doing a big change that may impact the home care workers. And has this change in our contract been discussed with the union yet? And in any change in a contract, don't the members have the authority and the responsibility to consider and approve or disapprove any change to their contract? Because that has not been done either. So I'm not sure you're going to be able to do anything about this. And my final comment would be, will this change impact the number of people that are presently insured? Because we have 330 workers, only 64 of them are receiving health care benefits. And many more qualify for health care benefits. So uh, I've known in the past years, I'll maybe take four or five years, not all of the funds have been utilized that are available to provide health care benefits. Each our work generates 60 cents in health care benefits. My feeling is that each individual that's paying into this fund should be able to receive some of those 60 cents an hour benefits, whether it's a complete coverage or it's just a stipend that helps them pay for their coverage, for their medication, or for office visits, or anything else that the individual member needs. So anyway, those are my comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, let me, uh, if it's all right, let me try to go through those, because I think you've got some legitimate um, concerns, Ms. Newman. Um, public authority. Ms. Councilor. <clears throat> so at the top of the agenda, um, you'll see that when we um, convene board meetings, we're convening as the Board of Supervisors, the In-Home Supportive Service Public Authority, the Calaveras County Air Pollution Control District, and the CSA 1, 2, 4, 8, and 12. Um, in the past, what we have done is we have in the agenda delineated uh, recessing as the board, um, reconvening as one of the various other entities, and then uh, recessing, and it, it becomes um, a bit convoluted. Um, and so our hope as staff was, because we are originally um, starting the meeting on behalf of all of these entities, that in an effort to streamline the agenda, streamline things to make it clear for the public, that through the headings, it's clear that the Board of Supervisors acting as the public authority, that's how it's agendized, that that is the action, that is the entity in which you are taking the action under, um, rather than having to do the recess, reconvene, recess, reconvene process. Um, so this, 
the, the way that it is agendized is proper under the law. We can do it this way. It is a way that we, as staff, have um, made an effort to streamline and make things easier. But if the board would like to go back to recessing, reconvening, recessing, reconvening, um, for each of the various entities, we can certainly do that. In doing that, any item that would be with the public authority, the Air Pollution Control District, or any of the CSAs would, in essence, be on the regular agenda because of the um, program that we use. And so that was another reason why we did it this way, to allow for items to be on consent, if necessary, and still be acting as the public authority. Everybody okay with that? So what you're basically saying is when we convene in the board at 9 o'clock in the morning, we're convening as all of those boards. <coughs> Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make that clear. So we're all good with that? Okay. Uh, have we, Ms. Hawkins, have we, concert, have we consulted with SEIU 2015? Yes, I had met with uh, Colleen Reeves and uh, Kristen Brinks, and then I had reached out uh, to SEIU, I believe it's 2015, and we did enter into a side letter with them. They, we gave them all of the information regarding um, Pan America. They did reach out to their membership, and we have a signed letter with them, and it was attached to the agenda item. Will this impact anybody's insurance? And when will this increase or decrease the number of insured? No, it will not. Thank you. I think that's. Um, the side letter was never received or notified by the members. Okay. Ms. Newman, I'll, maybe afterwards you could speak with Mrs. Ms. Um, Hawkins and she could share with you what is possible as a member. So, if there's any other further comment, public comment on this item. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Is there a motion? I'll move this item, Mr. Chair. Moved by Supervisor Toffinelli. Second. Second. Second, Second by Supervisor Mills. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Item 21 is from the Administrative Office to authorize the board chair to execute Amendment 1 to the Professional Services Agreement with O'Connell and Dempsey, LLC, for the provision of federal advocacy services to the Board of Supervisors, extending the term for one additional year and increasing the total not to exceed amount of the agreement by $64,000 for a total not to exceed amount of $128,000. Supervisor Callaway, you pulled the sign. I did. I um, support the concept of a federal advocacy. Uh, what I um, had concerns with is there is nothing in the documentation on what the return on the investment had been for the prior year and I noticed uh, some of the quite a few of the items that we were asking for for them to advocate for on our part were not under the control of the Board of Supervisors I would like to have the topic of um, this topic moved to a regular agenda item in um, our third meeting, if there's support for that, or fourth one, or... That's a good spot on the agenda. Yes, yeah, on spot on the agenda. I think <clears throat> this is important. I think we need to s establish what is it that we are asking. I mean, sometimes there's sidebar things that we would want help on on a particular issue and we want to know you know do they have the connections can they help us with that particular um, a particular issue but overall if we're going to expend money for advocacy services we need to be real clear what it is that we are asking them to do I also think it's important that we ask the departments, are there any issues that they think we should be following on a federal level? Um, Health and Human Services comes to mind because they receive quite a bit of federal funding. There was nothing in the items that said anything about roads, bridges, I mean, lobbying, 
the federal government on behalf of the counties really important. I mean, we do have CSAC, we have RCRC, and they do serve a purpose. <clears throat> but there's also things that are specific to Calaveras. So it's, I support the concept, um, and I'm not questioning the caliber of the company. I'm just saying that I think we need to have a broader discussion on what it is that we're asking them to do. And what return did we get? There was nothing in the documentation that I saw that indicated a return. Thank you. Supervisor Mills or Supervisor Tafanelli? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, as you recall, Chair, because this is something we decided in the previous board as to what exactly we wanted Ms. O'Connell to be doing for us. And I will tell you from a COG perspective, she has been tireless uh, in our efforts, especially with the Wagon Trail Project and other uh, rural broadband is another one she's been involved in. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Amber Collins with COG can tell you that it's been, she's been right there uh, when it comes to a FLAP grant or bill grant or any of the other grants that the federal government is pushing forward. Uh, what's the point of us making those grant applications if we don't have an advocate to help push that uh, forward right there at, at DC, which she has done. And uh, we're starting to get some traction. As you know, it takes time. Uh, we really do need to have our congressman involved in these projects if we're gonna be successful. So it isn't just what Ms. O'Connell's doing, but also what our congressman and his staff are doing as well to assist us in, in uh, accomplishing the goals that we've set out in our previous board's decisions. Sure, it's tough now. Yeah, Rita knows we've used Mia for a long time. Um, we had to, during the recession, let her go, but she's back. I'm behind it. I think she's a good advocate for us. Um, the funding for this is in your, the county administrative office's budget already. I would like to move forward with it, um, the funding of it and approving this, but I'm with Marita. I think we should need to have Mia come back and give us a presentation and give her direction as a board on her next moves and what we're looking for. But Mia has been very active. Dennis is correct. Um, Amber Collins, uh, the county, um, she's, her services are great. Um, Marita, you know we used her for years before. So, but I am in a favor with moving this forward funding it and then having her come in to us at a future date here, hopefully shortly, um, and get a hold of her and put a presentation before the board and uh, us give her direction going forward. Uh, Gary, Gary has just said exactly what I was thinking. Um, I, I do support absolutely uh, her coming in and us giving direction on what our priorities are for her to work on. <clears throat> and uh, but w it is an invaluable resource for us in our connection with the federal government um, to have things lobbied for or help with the grant process as we move forward as a county and this is one of the things that facilitates that moving forward okay. um, it's I'm not questioning the competency I'm not questioning the need I am questioning there is, there is nothing in our staff report that says what has been done. I mean, Mr. Mills mentioned some things. I mean, that's fine. But I look at the staff report and it says such priorities, water resources, water supply, aging infrastructure, flood protection. That is not under the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Um, maybe broadband, I'd let them have, I'll let you have that. Water, wastewater, disposal, loan, and grant programs. That is not under the purview. And if we want to have that, then where is the partnership with the water agencies of Calaveras County? Should we be paying all, and I know they have their own lobbyists, but should we also be paying? That's, there's nothing on here about roads. There's nothing in here on bridges. There is nothing in here on health and human services. There's nothing in here under the purview, really, of the Board of Supervisors. Um, 
a reduction of hazardous fuels and tree mortality. I'll give us that. But we have a one whole priority is water resources. And where are the other departments on issues that they might have? There's nothing in here on that. Um, so, I, as I said, unless we re look at what it is we're going to be asking the advocacy, the lobbyists to do on our behalf, I want something like that. The list of what we think is important that's under our purview um, should be part of the agreement and it isn't in this document, which is why I wanted to have a meeting where we could set what the priorities are. I, I, so I can't support this as presented to us today. I am a weigh in. I am. Um, uh, Marina and I spoke briefly about this last night, and, and uh, you know, I I deal closely with Mia a lot, and I really think very highly of her work. Um, and so I feel like I was close to it, and I didn't read too closely on this agenda item. And perhaps there is a bit of a disconnect between the agenda item and what we all know who work with her, what she's doing. I think it is fully appropriate that we bring her in as soon as we can and discuss what our federal priorities are. Those priorities were set under a prior board. We need to either affirm them or change them, but I think this board ought to be part of that. And I think that's a very good idea. We ought to get that. And she ought to be here for that. So that's something we're probably not going to be able to get done in a week. Might take a couple weeks to get things scheduled and get her on out here, and I think we'd all ask the CAO to coordinate that. Um, so I, I agree with you that uh, we should uh, we should certainly have a follow up meeting to our priorities. I think it's a very good idea. Uh, Supervisor Stopper. <clears throat> um, I mean, under I, I Marita does have some good points, and I think we do have a consensus that to revisit this, and you know, uh, overall. Um, there, there's, there's, so, there's some uh, with the cooperation when it comes to uh, water rights and uh, other things. Um, some, some of it has to do with land use issues and everything, and that goes in hand in hand with uh, cooperation with the uh, districts overall. And I do know that CCWD does have the same um, Mia under underneath them also. So. <clears throat> there, there, you have legitimate concerns on, on one side, but the, uh, on the other side, it takes the cooperation of us making sure that we have the proper uh, things moving forward when it comes to land use so that they can, we can support our fellow districts inside the county. This says nothing about land use. It, has, it <clears throat> says we want you to focus on water supply and aging infrastructure. Uh, uh, we uh, want you to focus on flood protection. This doesn't have anything. That's not what we're asking. Okay, well, there seems to be consensus amongst the board that for the CAO to invite Ms. O'Connell out as soon as we can and discuss our priorities with her. Um, that aside, is there a motion on this item 21 or further discussion? Excuse me. Is there public comment on this item? Al? Yeah, thank you. Al Sagala, Taxpayer Association. Um, I wonder if we have a situation of the forest and the trees. We're focused on the trees, and actually we're asking the federal government to spend more money, not realizing that the federal government is not very responsible when it comes to money. As a matter of fact, it could be very serious. We have a national debt it's incredible. We have, we're spending more interest on that national debt than we are on defense of our country. Think about that. What would happen if the interest rates went up 1%? What would happen to our monetary system? So, since we're part of the United States and we do see the need to be uh, wise in fiscal matters ourselves, we ought to look at the federal government and not encourage them to become irresponsible. There's ways that we can handle uh, the 
expected uh, emergencies that we have in our area, like fire. Um, I don't know if there's an insurance available for that right now, but uh, we certainly could be working toward being independent, putting money aside, and it'll be a large, lot amount of a lot of money will eventually build up, and that money can be loaned out short term, just like the uh, utilities do when they put money aside for future repairs of pipes that they know they're going to have to spend. We know we're going to have to spend money on on fire emergencies. And so <clears throat> it's almost like reading our seed corn. A farmer puts aside some of his corn for the next year's harvest. And if he fails to do so, <clears throat> there's some real dramatic consequences. He won't have any corn. Okay, similar to that is planning for future expenses. If we don't plan for future expenses, then we are subject to begging the state or the federal government for money, which is where we are now. Okay, how do we get out of this? Well, first we have to realize that the federal government is not a responsible financial entity, and then try to encourage the federal government to become so. One way to do that is not ask them for more money. I know if I were supervisor, I wouldn't agree with any of this because I'm into uh, <laughs> I'm into getting the you know getting the grants. But in any case, please consider that. Thank you. Is there any other further public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for further discussion or a motion. Um, I want to just one comment on Supervisor Callaway's comments about what it says here um, in flood protection not being within our purview. Um, I'll have to disagree with that. Uh, Coscove Creek, um, the federal agencies we work with to get the, the permits and be able to get in there and uh, do annually clean up in there. Um, we had a project with um, Corps of Engineers at one time, and anytime there is flooding, um, we go out and we do locally what we can with our public works department to resolve the issues with our constituents during the flood stages. So flood protection, I think, um, is part of our purview uh, when it comes to um, dealing with the federal government uh, agencies that we do to get the permits that we use. So um, on that point, um, I will move this item, Mr. Chair. Additionally, if you recall just recently about BLM and a grant, and she was aware of it, pushed it forward to us, helped us to get, uh, you know, if we were going to get involved, to get involved. But there are many things that happen in Washington, D.C. that, you know, it's almost a vacuum. It never really gets out to the to the world that needs to make use of those op opportunities. So uh, she's been very, very good at being sure to transfer that information to us in a timely manner. And with that, I'll second it. We have a motion and a second for the discussion. Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. For one, Callaway, no. Is it no? Okay. Regular Item. agenda. Item 23 is from Human Resources to adopt a resolution appointing Douglas Oliver to the position of Chief Building Official, effective September 3rd, 2019. Judy Hawkins, Human Resources and Risk Director. Chair, members of the board, I am very happy to bring before you a resolution appointing Doug Oliver to the position of Chief Building Official. We have been on the search for a building official building official since January. We have done several initial interviews and then uh, July 23rd, the board had done a closed session interview with uh, Mr. Oliver and had directed the um, HR staff to bring forward this resolution. Mr. Oliver has served as the chief building official for Tuolumne County for the last 12 years. I apologize to the HR director in Tuolumne that we have stolen him. Um, but I am very happy for us. Chief building officials are very difficult to come by. Um, 
Mr. Oliver has uh, worked in many different aspects in the um, building world, and I think he will be a fantastic addition to Calaveras County. Also, one of the other uh, things that I think will be wonderful is he is a resident of Calaveras County. So we didn't, act, we didn't actually steal him. He's been here. So he was we ours. We let Tuolumne borrow him because yes, he lives here. Yes, he was, he was ours to begin with. Thank you. Well, we will, um, I will ask uh, Mr. Oliver to say a few words after we assume we approve your resolution. But uh, as I call for public comment. Al Gallant Taxpayer Association. Every, you seem to get better and better all the time. This is probably one of the best decisions you've made all year. The, uh, well, there might be another one. <laughs> uh, Doug Oliver is uh, so outstanding. Uh, not only is he an excellent communicator, he's got wisdom, and he understands the Constitution and individual rights. He happens to be uh, on the board of directors of uh, uh, the uh, Copperopolis uh, uh, Homeowners uh, Property Owners Association and doing an excellent job there. And uh, I'm just amazed at, I don't know how you did it, but this is wonderful. And now it, I apologize to Tuolumne County. They're going to have a, a big void to fill. But uh, uh, congratulations. Thank you. Is there f further public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, discussion or a motion? I'll move this item, Mr. Chair. Second. Moved by Supervisor Toffinelli, second by Supervisor Stopper. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5 0. Welcome aboard, Mr. Oliver. Thank you. Would you like to say a couple words? Suppose I could wing it. Uh, I guess all I can say is that I'm, I'm humbled. Uh, 22 years of, of uh, public service uh, has led me to this point. I've had the privilege and the distinct honor to serve Tuolumne County for 12 years, but I, I consider this a, a significant step up because I have the honor now to serve my community. Um, I'm thankful for this opportunity, and uh, I'm also thankful for the trust you've invested in me uh, in the performance of these duties. So uh, I'll do everything I can to represent and defend this, uh, this county. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, when you're, and when you're done, they're going to take you in the back room. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, by the way, I, unfortunately, uh, Al, I, I do have to resign that HOA board position now due to conflict of interest. So, so Thank you. Uh, another sad group of people now, unfortunately. Welcome aboard, Doug. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeff, I want to thank you for all the work you've done in keeping this going. Uh, coming back out of retirement and stepping up, really appreciate it. I think I speak on behalf of the board. We got, it done. We got her done, yeah. <laughs> We didn't go over the deadline, but uh, we're getting close. So I think on behalf of the board, we want to express our gratitude to you Thank as well. You. And onward. Thank you. Could, could we just take a one minute for um, Kathy to be able to set up for the next item? Yes. OK. One minute. One minute. She's done. Yeah. <laughs> is from Economic Development, to receive a semi-annual presentation from the Calaveras County Economic and Community Development Department regarding activities for the last two quarters of fiscal year 2018-2019. Good morning, Honorable Chair and Board of Supervisors. Kathy Galino, Calaveras County Economic and Community Development. I'm here to do my semi-annual report. Um, one thing I do want to point out before we get started is that um, I had updated one of the slides, um, but apparently when I went to upload an IQM2, I made a mistake. So I uh, have that slide for the public and for you. So it's been a very exciting last two quarters. One of the things I want to talk about is I'm going to be developing a strategic plan, working forward on identifying projects, and supporting the CAO's office. In doing so, my mission is to attract, retain, and grow 
a diverse array of businesses by providing direct one-on-one -on -one business assistance aimed at streamlining, streamlining the permit and regulatory process while preserving our historic and rural ambiance throughout the county. The vision is to enhance the economic vitality and the quality of life for all Calaveras County residents by making it the most prosperous rural county in California. Some of the areas that I'm focusing on um, are tech, retail, manufacturing, forestry, agricultural, natural resources, and tourism. Tourism is a huge economic boost in our county. And then balancing the history and the beauty and preservation. So my goals are to attract the right business to the right location. We have a general plan that's hopefully going to be adopted soon. Um, and connecting businesses to the right resources, no matter what phase of uh, development they're in, whether they're considering opening a business or expanding a business, knowing what resources are out there and facilitating those multi-agency meetings to get the right folks in the room to help again streamline the process and stimulate resiliency. This is something I'll be talking about later in the presentation as we are p potentially facing the public safety power shutdowns that will not only impact us but impact our businesses and our communities collaborating to work with other agencies and organizations throughout the county um, and promoting private investment into our communities, promoting educational opportunities. Workforce is the number one issue when you're trying to attract a business to Calaveras County. They want to know what their workforce is and then with that comes housing. I'll talk more about that as well. And then identify and develop incentives to businesses access to capital, access to other resources and consultants. We have some great partnerships through the SBDC, through the Chamber, through SBA, through other agencies and organizations. And the bottom line is to increase revenue into Calaveras County and promote good paying jobs. So how do I make these things happen? Marketing, 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 right? Um, having a social media presence is invaluable. It's the way things are done. It's a cutting edge, whether it's through my website, through Facebook, through other social media, having a hashtag, Calaveras for Business, and brochures. I did develop some brochures. Actually, the Chamber um, helped me with that. They had a grant, um, so they were able to print those brochures for me. Um, and then direct outreach, going to conferences, going to trainings, talking to people, going to community meetings. That's where it really happens. That's where people get to know who I am, what I do, and how great it is to be here. And then working with developers, realtors, brokers to promote financial investment. Um, attending business roundtables and then con conducting business walks, <coughs> which we started, we, uh, we did start in March of 2019. We did our first business walk in uh, Copperopolis. It was very successful. Um, and then the chamber executive director took a position with the county. I love Stacy. Um, so I need that <coughs> partnership. So I'm waiting for new leadership and direction from the chamber and then partnering with the various business associations throughout all our communities in Calaveras. Going back to doing those business walks where we just one-on-one -on -one talk to businesses, find out what's going on, how we can help, let them know we're here as a resource and a tool and getting that feedback getting the surveys completed. They're re really simple. Um, and then following up, some of the businesses in Copper did have some follow-up questions that we were able to work through. Um, and then working on a business resiliency program. So that's, that's a pretty big item, um, especially given what the PSPS, as I mentioned, and emergency preparedness. Most of our businesses have no idea what to do or how to prepare. So working with OES and other organizations through the county, um, as well as business associations, and at the state and federal level, um, working with uh, partners to develop a website that will be a database of resources that can be accessed by anyone. So I'm working on that with, it's actually a five county collaborative with Mariposa, Amador, Tuolumne, um, Alpine, um, and uh, also Chico State is uh, assisting. They actually have quite a bit of GIS and mapping data that they're providing to us for free. And uh, then the northern region, 
Siskiyou, Del Norte, Humboldt, I can't remember all five, um, and working, as I said, in a collaboration with other rural counties to get our businesses ready for, for what could be, whether it's fire, disaster, PSPS, or whatnot, knowing that there is insurance out there, that there are options out there um, to help them survive. How old that picture? That picture happens to be two years old. Um, that is uh, my beautiful booth setup and banner and table cover. That was actually at the Calaveras County Fair when I had a booth, and some of you actually worked that booth with me. That's a brand new picture. I actually just took that one a couple weeks ago. So uh, another aspect of my duties is to facilitate technical pre-application and permit submittal assistance. I find that I can help assist my brothers and sisters throughout the county, whether it's uh, building, planning, public works, to get folks ready to submit their permits and plans, and then actually facilitate meetings. So to, if there's questions or concerns or there needs to be more clarification, I can help facilitate that so that we actually have an action plan to move those things forward. Um, working on developing fact sheets and flow charts um, and streamlining the permitting process. That's really critical for both the businesses and it helps our agencies and departments. Um, as I mentioned, depending on where a business is in the process, whether they're wanting to do an expansion or a relocation, finding out where they are in the process and knowing what they need, whether it's business planning, that's the, that's the Bible to me is a business plan. A lot of businesses, especially small businesses, have a great idea. They don't know how to apply it, how to plan for it. And then working with our utility providers, funding, site selection, and workforce. And then providing compliance assistance for changing operations. I see this primarily in the food industry lately um, and some in the retail sector where they're wanting to do an expansion and actually bring a whole new um, facet to their business. So making sure that they are it's in compliance and they know who they need to speak with in expanding. Um, I mentioned developing and promoting business incentives, ident uh, identifying funding opportunities for rural businesses through grant and loan programs. I was just at the Cal Ed conference in Eureka, Eureka I found it, um, last week and there was quite a bit of information that was actually came from EDA, um, which is a federal agency, as well as um, um, USDA. So um, there is opportunities and I want to start exploring those and figuring out how we can partner into those for our businesses. PG&E, as I mentioned, does have an economic development rate, which is a 12% discount for five years. It's pretty tough to get in that program, um, but it is still available to us. Opportunity zones, so this is a new uh, thing that came up last year in District 2. What we need to do at this point is identify what do we want to target for that district what business opportunities are there. It is starting to ramp up. I have received calls from financial investors that are interested in what, do, what can we do in Calaveras County. So we will be bringing that back as part of the CAO's um, finance and, and uh, strategic planning. And then uh, connected to the California Business Gateway, which directs businesses directly from the California Go Biz site to us as well as the California Business Incentive Gateway. So visit, visit my website, like my Facebook page. Hmm. Um, so leveraging resources and grants. As I mentioned, that's a big part of what I'm looking at doing um, and trying to find what suits us best, what will give us the most bang for our buck. There are a lot of grants out there. Um, and in possibly working with Mia, really targeting what we need to do. Um, I've tried doing the whole shotgun approach where I can do them all. I really can't. I really need to target what I want to do specifically for economic and community development. Um, and then leveraging those with other programs such as uh, historical preservation. I know that that's something that's important, not just to um, our board and our leadership, but also to our communities. Um, I did receive the Census 2020 grant, it's a $50,000 grant that I will be doing education and outreach with. I have developed a website, or I should say our, our wonderful IT folks have developed a website, and I'll be doing that collaboration and outreach. Um, we've had two, three community meetings 
um, in which we've had, you know, community leaders, school districts. Um, I'll be working with the City of Angels Camp um, and other partners throughout the county. We have the California Parks and Recreation per capita program funding that will be coming in hopefully next month. It will be $400,000 to the county for parks and recreation. Then at the state level, we have the California Community Development Block Grants, which is the CDBG. I have a hard time saying that. There are over-the-counter grants that are up to $3 million that are based or that are focused on infrastructure improvements. And I know one of the things that we've been looking at here is capital improvements at the government center. We have aging infrastructure. We have buildings that need repair and roofs that need to be fixed. So that might be something that we could do, look at, and work in collaboration with my other um, agencies. There's the Recreational uh, Rural Tourism Grant, working with the Califor Calaveras Visitors Bureau, Martin Hubbardy, on exploring that, leveraging, leveraging resources and then exploring many, many others. Um, uh, I do have some budget for a grant writing person. I could probably do one good shot at it. What I'd like to do is potentially make it a contingency, so if I get the grant, they get paid. I don't know if I can really do that. I'll have to talk to the um, purchasing agent and find out if that is viable to do. But um, there's so many grants out there, and as I said, trying to identify, get direction from the board and from the CAO, what do we go after? What is the most likely that we will win? And what's the return on investment? And what is the cost to us to administer? And matches. So attracting manufacturing with good paying jobs and investing and growing in Calaveras County. Assist in workforce development. I was appointed to the Motherlode Job Training Board of Directors um, a few months ago and will be very active in getting that workforce, getting the training, doing career technical pathways, working with the high schools to have a skilled workforce, to have local education stay in Calaveras. It's hard when our kids leave. It's hard to get them back. <coughs> and then, obviously, workforce housing. There's not a lot of rentals that uh, young folks can afford. And Kristen Stranger has been amazing. She does have projects that are going to have workforce housing, affordable housing components in them. I believe there's 15 units that are scheduled for San Andreas. So, and, and then I've got two other partnerships that are private developers, one in Valley Springs and one in Copperopolis, that is looking at doing workforce affordable housing as part of their, their development build out. So very exciting. Um, promoting career technical education, trade schools, college extension campuses. Again, this is something that's gonna come before the board in my strategic planning and I want direction and focus. Um, so, and then the high schools and colleges. So there was the program the second year of On the Right Track was very, very successful. Uh, that was in collaboration with the Chamber of Commerce and all the different folks where we worked with the high school students, seniors, who are getting ready to graduate and they are given a life scenario. And whether it's opening a business, closing a business, having to figure out how to get a birth certificate or a business license, and working with these youth, providing them with the information that they can take at home in a binder it was really great. And it was really interesting because not all the kids, in fact, a majority of the children that I spoke with at both Calaveras and Bret Hart were not going to a four-year school. They were either going to a two-year school or a credential program, um, and about 14% were going to the military. So I thought that was an interesting statistic. Um, in the past, it's been very high. It's usually about 60% go to a four-year. So interesting. There's some dynamic changes. And we are short of skilled trades. We need electricians. We need plumbers, welders, um, and different skilled trades. Um, and then collaboration, as I said, with the uh, Calaveras Business Resource Center, the chamber, on promoting business training and workshops. This is really important. A lot of small businesses don't know how to do payroll or they don't always know how to do all the things that go into having a small business. So having those trainings is really key. <coughs> so creating and strengthening amazing partnerships. So my 18 months here, I have really, really made some great, amazing partnerships. Great agencies to work with and departments. Obviously there has been some change in the board, in the CAO, 
and building and public works, but we have a really good group of people, and I think you'll hear this over and over, that we can really move the needle now for Calaveras County. We work very collaboratively, very cohesively, and it's a really great place to be and work and live. Um, as I mentioned, Calaveras County Chamber of Commerce and the Business Resource Center, the B Visitors Bureau, Martin Hubbardy, again, a great asset to our county. Business and Real Estate Associations, Motherload Job Training, Columbia College, Stanislaus State, Calaveras Cog, Amber, again, um, a very important person that I work with and talk with about leveraging resources and trying to move in the same direction in an effective and efficient way. Fire districts, um, Cal Fire, there's a lot that plays into economic and community development. It's not just jobs um, and creating jobs, it's also having safe places to live and be. Um, the, federal, the federal and state agencies and utility providers. Broadband is a big deal. Um, I have great relationships with Volcano, with uh, Conifer, Calnet, not so much with AT&T and, and uh, Comcast, but um, we need to start leveraging those resources and bringing that here. We need to have that connectivity for businesses to succeed and grow. So here's the six month summary, my three-legged stool. So business development supports skilled workforce and having a living wage for our people. The county property asset evaluation and lease renewals, I've been working on that a bit. Um, I have developed kind of a comprehensive list as best to my research and technical abilities of what the county has as property assets. And we probably need to look at that at some point. Do we need to keep all these properties? Maybe we could sell or make them available for developers for bringing uh, other funding and investment into our county. Uh, also, on our lease renewals, I have a, a knack for those kind of things and want to support my CAO's office as I'm part of that um, office and looking at you know renewals and making sure that you know there is a, a, a benefit for us and for the entities. So during the last two quarters, I assisted 55 new businesses, 17 existing businesses, and 12 that were expanding. So this is up 24% from the last two quarters that I reported. So the word's getting out there. People know that I'm here. People are being referred to me by word of mouth, which is really interesting. My website statistics are really pretty good, too. I think, um, where is it? It might be in the, in the board report. But I typically have about 200 to 300 hits on the website a month. So going from 84 to that is pretty amazing. And I, I said, please, please like the web, or like the Facebook, visit the website. Um, so agritourism workshop, that happened the first quarter of this year. We had 38 local farmers and ranchers that want to explore agritourism. Um, not all in Calaveras County, but a majority were from Calaveras County. Um, and looking at that as an opportunity for expanding farming and ranching and agriculture was great. I've done 30 outreach and education events, about 1,600 people. I run out of business cards very quickly, and I will run out of brochures even faster. Um, then I said the six grant and funding opportunities, the Census 2020 award, 12 workforce development opportunities, engaging 798 um, folks, continuing to support for housing projects with a potential of 1,200 homes throughout the county. These are long term. Um, direct marketing and outreach to eight commercial companies and two domestic manufacturers. I had been working with GoBiz on doing some international uh, marketing for, uh, I think there was um, an Italian company that was a solar panel manufacturer. Um, I'm not finding that there's a lot of bang in that buck, so let's look local. I'd rather look at things in California or in the United States rather than looking at international at this point. I think I'm biting off too much. So the future, this is the new slide. So support work with uh, two of the CAO's main objectives that you have provided or that you have given them direction on. Number one is accountability. So developing a framework for economic and community development strategic plan, strategic plan, where I have measurable outcomes 
where I can really focus where I need to be and what I need to do to support all of our communities and our goals. Identify areas of focus, as I said. Revenue and fiscal stability. This is an important one, as um, we all know. So identify investment opportunities, whether it's through the opportunity zones, whether it's through the recycling market development zone, whether it's siting a biomass facility somewhere in the county and attracting that, because we are really ideally placed for that. Um, and exploring specific grants through economic and community development. Continue attracting and retaining and growing businesses, kind of keeping that going. And then support and strengthen our communities with skilled workforce, affordable workforce housing, and implementing the Census 2020 education and outreach. Questions and comments? Board member questions? Just say informational item only. Sure, I stop. <clears throat> Let me get back to uh, uh, packet page 261, the uh, whoops, here, 24A. Um, actions, you, you talked about presenting an action plan, um, you know, helping to facilitate the technical pre application and permit submittal assistance. <clears throat> where, where, where can people find that and, and how do you go about doing that? So, so way, the way that typically works is um, a business or an entity will contact me. <coughs> will contact me. Swallowing my spit. <coughs> so a business will typically contact me via the website, email, or telephone call. They'll tell me what their plan is or what their idea is, what they want to do. And then I will reach out to the various department hats and say, here's what we've got. Here's a location they're looking at. I typically start with the planning department because zoning is critical. Then we look at building public works or what are they going to need to do to actually develop that property or reutilize the property. So it typically comes to me, I help coordinate that facilitation. They may come in with a permit application that's not complete or gee I need to get my business license first or whatever that process is whatever they need and I'm kind of like the the focal point the one stop shop and then I can get them where they need to be and then they understand what the process is because sometimes people don't know what to do first where in the process am I where do I submit how many sets of plans so helping facilitate that and then talking to the other department heads so that they're aware hey this is coming down the pipe um, what do you think? Is this a go, no go? Because we don't want to waste anybody's time or, or money. So we want to make sure that we have a coordinated effort. So there's, <clears throat> with certain businesses, is there, is there a written action plan for moving forward for, for people? You know, um, <clears throat> one, one size fits all. No. No. There's definitely there's not def one size fits well, all. Well, but there's, you know, there are certain businesses that come in and do the same thing. So do we have any of that written out? Um, no. 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 Okay. So each, each business is individual. Um, and, but there are, you know, I do take notes and then we follow up typically electronically um, and, and some of the agencies will follow up via letter. Okay, so here's uh, our first review. Here's what you still need to submit. And so there's follow up that way. And then I tend to they tend to follow up with me if things are going well, if things are not going well, if there's <coughs> confusion, and then I'll help, you know, pull the group together again and clarify what needs to be done. So it just depends. Yeah. I, <clears throat> the, the reason I ask is, uh, is everyone being held to the same standard? Because there could be two different people with the same type of business coming in and be and everything so I mean once we get a track with one person I think the next person that comes in should be held to the same track absolutely and, um, yeah, it's the, the and same level some of sometimes there is differences in that track depending on who you go to in a department and ask so um, may you know just a thought for the future uh, once we once we set a uh, precedence for a certain business maybe we should uh, get get something you know, because um, when you, you present an action plan, there should be an action plan, not, you know, every different time the same business comes in asking, you know, 
the different departments what to do. Once you've done it for that certain type of business, it should be the same thing over and over. So, well, in my opinion, it would be nice to have a flow chart or something where it's like, okay, you have X, Y, or Z type business. Here's your here's your flow chart. Here's what you need mm -hmm. to do. Um, that would be good. Um, but the other issue is that not every business comes to me first. Sometimes they may end up at planning and then they don't know to go to building and then there's a, a snafu and then I get called in to help fix it. So I may not be their first point. And so again, there's kind of that, typically they come to me first, but, and there's some businesses that don't or some projects that don't come to me at all. I may not know about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you. Supervisor Mills? Yes, Kathy, you'd uh, spoken about the California Park and Rec program funding that's coming. Uh, is that in the form of a grant? It's a per capita funding, so there's no match. It's a one-time one time. One time off, and it'll come through the CAO's office. Hopefully with the formation or reestablishment of our Park and Rec Commission, we can start to identify those areas and those projects that will give us the best use of that money if it's one-time money. Uh, that doesn't require ongoing support. Um, the two communities that are, are in essence, I'm sure, identified as park deficient is Valley Springs and Copperopolis, which are two very large areas uh, serving a lot of people without having the access to baseball diamonds and soccer fields and everything else that uh, the other places have. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to focus on what can we do with that money that's going to give us not only those parks, but from parks, uh, we can generate the funding, or the uh, ability to put together hotel and motel operations because their occupancy rate does hinge on hotels. If you look in, the, in our county, where we have the most parks is where we have our largest number of Airbnbs or largest number of hotels. Uh, those are the communities that have already got it together. But for those that don't or that are deficient and want to develop their economic base, that's seed money that should be very wisely used to help pull that together for those communities. So I'm just making a point. Thank you, and good luck with that arm wrestling. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, we <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, Kathy, thank you very much for your presentation. You know, in your presentation, you mentioned business plans are being key to you. Um, you know, one of my concerns of when we started this position was I was always worried about the cart before the horse, and so you know, we didn't have our we didn't have an economic development plan in place when he came on board. Uh, as a result, you're doing everything for everyone, uh, which is incredibly difficult job because it makes it's hard to focus and move big projects forward. It's clear. How are you doing on developing that business plan, that economic development plan, so we can? give you the cover to focus on the major things that you need to get done and not get drawn away and, and have better chance of success. Well, thank you. Um, I have drafted a rough sketch of what the plan would cover. It's probably very broad, probably needs to be uh, toned down a bit. And I know that it's one of the things that hopefully I'll be bringing forward um, with the CAO um, but I have looked at other plans. I want something that is vetted by our communities as well as the board. So do we want this particular business here? How many do I attract? How many housing units are appropriate? Where? Um, but I do have a start, as I said. Um, it's taken me a little bit to get to know the ins and outs. Um, but a lot of the things that I'm working on, like the census, that'll be a one-off. I won't be, that'll give me more time to focus. I am going to the um, Caled certification, ACE certification, which is an accredited certified program for economic developers in Fresno next week. And one full day is gonna be focused on strategic planning. I don't know that I'll need a consultant. I'm gonna see what I can learn and what I can do on my own. Um, but at some point I may need to, to request that I have some assistance um, in developing that document and doing the surveying. I'm not going to survey monkey this thing. This needs to be really be done at a high level. I know that the, um, you know, I, I would advise you, you know, there's probably been a half dozen of these reports written over the last 20 years. And the ones that I've read all generally say the same thing. 
Um, you know, so be creative. You know, Supervisor Mills had a good point. If we focused your work upon things like a park, there are a lot of auxiliary things that come off of that, as, as the supervisor uh, correctly noted. Um, so if there are things like that that we could allow you to focus on and really be a game changer, that'd be great. Because otherwise, you're just going to be another version of the Chamber of Commerce and chasing everything. Right. And I think that wouldn't be very satisfying to you. And it's probably not going to move us forward as quickly. So, right. so um, Mr. Alt wanted to make a statement. I just wanted to touch, um, kind of make a distinction between what we're seeing here today with Kathy and what we will see. So uh, we all have expectations around accountability, and this is really, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, Kathy's catalog of the work effort that she's had over the past six months. Um, as you can see, and you touched on it, uh, the, the activities are all over the board. I commend Kathy has been a great team player. She picks up anything we ask her to, anywhere there's a void. Kathy ends up filling that, and I very much appreciate that. Um, however, what you're seeing is that also creates a disconnect in our real focused planning around big issues, uh, a, a really high return on investment items. And so what she and I have talked about, and she's investigating and will bring back here, or what are those focus areas? And it'd be much the, like what we discussed in strategic planning in my goals. What are the high level areas that we want to focus on that are really heavy bang for the buck that will have a return for us? For example, if it's residential development, then she would have a priority under that particular area to focus in a year, a good measure of her time on assisting with land use and residential development, as an example. If it's parks and quality of life issues, then those are another high level area. Well, there'll be two or three very key core activities that Kathy will lead with partners to, to bring home bigger projects. Right now, what Kathy suffered from is the lack of leadership in the CAO's office. So in the time she's been here, she's had at least two, if not three. And so to be a good team player, she's picked up work to do work, but she hasn't had us focusing her work or the support of a CAO giving her the bandwidth to work on really high impact projects. And so we're, we're transitioning out of the catch-all and a fantastic team player into bringing back those focus areas to the board where you will have discussion on what will those key focus areas be and then we'll develop projects under those so that we'll get heavy return on the effort that Kathy's putting forward. Um, that's really what she's touching at in the future piece and how our strategic planning will look for the economic development plan. Any other questions? Uh, this is not action time, but we will have public comment. Al? Uh, House of Talent, Taxpayer Association. Uh, she was a star on our Taxpayer Alert program. And uh, what she talked about then <coughs> is evolved pretty close to what she was, uh, except it's much more complicated now. Um, one of the things that we, we were following is what was happening in Tuolumne County with your economic development. And it was pretty serious. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> there was a lot of fluff, but no meat. And, uh, and uh, things were being hidden. And so there was no sunshine. And what happened is that the economic development uh, person there had to leave. Uh, we don't have that condition here. If you probably noticed the last slide, she gave the number of people that she talked to on different categories, the number of businesses. There was a list there, very specific. Uh, it was really uh, sunshine. <clears throat> she didn't say many. She said 532 or whatever. And so this is a good thing. Um, in Tuolumne County, they had a <clears throat> kind of a reform of government where they had a, a uh, community development uh, director, and, which means kind of like uh, somebody in charge of community development. Well, I noticed that we're having a little bit of mission creep here. We're having economic development and community development. And I'm hoping that the meaning is different than what it was there. Uh, there, under this director, was the building department and the planning department. And a tremendous amount of control. And it's not about promotion so much as control. So uh, the, our taxpayer group seems to think that we can have maximum prosperity by having maximum freedom, maximum liberty, property rights. 
if, if the property rights of people are protected and, and the development process is not too complicated, uh, we should be doing okay. So the focus on having things clear and easy to understand would really help the economic development situation. Ben Stopper hit the nail right on the head. Do we have a manual uh, developing property in Calaveras County? Okay, let's see. Building department's going to want certain things. Uh, planning department's going to want certain things. And there's certain phone numbers. And uh, it shouldn't be too hard to put that together. And maybe the departments themselves can help because it will help them. And so if they go, somebody goes to the planning department, here's a little manual developing property in Calaveras County. They go to the building department, here's that same manual. And, and something like that shouldn't be too hard to put together and could be a tremendous benefit. And also, the different people would be told the same thing. It's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Further public comment, Ms. Corda. I think Kathy did a great job, and uh, it's, it's hard to start at the seat of your pants like she has and, and do as well as she has. And I congratulate her. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Kathy, I also want to thank you for being such a team player. Uh, CAO Alt was correct. You pick up stuff as, as it goes along, and hopefully we'll work together and we'll do our job and make your job more successful. Thank other, you. Other comments? Or Supervisor Toffanelli? Thank you, Kathy. I want to thank you very much for the job you've done. Thank you. You've helped tremendously in my district and throughout the county. So thank you. I also want to thank you, Kathy. And sometimes you catch some of the most interesting things in your uh, in your meetings with people, and kind of lead you down rabbit holes at times. I'm sure, but uh, you've taken on every task that has been thrown at you, and you've done it with a smile, which is great. Thank you very much. We'll conclude that item. We are five minutes from noon. John, you want to stand between us and lunch, or do you want to be the first one up? When we come Did back. Do you guys all promise to have caffeine at lunch? Uh, no, we always drink caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I serve at your pleasure, sir. I, I can either way. Well, I think that uh, yeah, I think that with five minutes out, I'm going to call it, and we're going to come back here at 1:30. And you're first up. So thank you very much thank for you. patience. Good afternoon, welcome back to the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, Supervisor Calloway had to step out for one quick phone call, but uh, she wanted us to start going, so um, Madam Clerk. Item 25 is from the Office of Emergency Services to receive an update on Calaveras County's preparedness activities regarding PG&E's Public Safety Power Shutdown Program. John? Good afternoon, uh, Supervisors and Mr. Chairman. John Osborne, your Director of OES. Uh, you guys all should have a copy of, okay. so we'll get started. Um, first, a little background about the power safety, power, public safety power shutdown, uh, and that's an example of why I will probably just call it PSPS from here on out. Um, PSPS, uh, other power entities have been practicing uh, de-energizing de their lines for a couple of years. Following the 2017 PG&E fire season, PG&E began implementing their community wildfire safety program, which includes uh, turning off the power for public safety purposes. Uh, PG&E's first uh, shutoff was in October of 2018. It was in the area of the North Bay and the Sierra Foothills, uh, Southern Butte County, Northern Yuba County, and then uh, North, uh, North Bay, uh, uh, Sonoma, Napa, that area. Um, it lasted about three days. Um, so that was the first one. Um, the criteria that they use for deciding when they are going to discontinue power is uh, kind of a matrix of different things. Um, 
and they all have a different impact depending on where where the uh, event is taking place geographically. So there's going to be a red flag warning, which generally means that there are extremely low humidity levels under 20 percent. There are su sustained winds of 25 miles an hour with gusts up to 45. Um, and of course, that these numbers here are dependent on temperature, terrain, and climate. Uh, another factor is fuel conditions and what the moisture content of uh, that fuel is. And then uh, real-time information from pg and &E's Wildfire Safety Operations Center and their crews in the field. So all of those things go into the decision-making matrix. Oh. So uh, this is a map of Calaveras County. Um, they have three tiers of uh, fire threat. Um, tier one would be like uh, the lake there. Uh, tier two is the orange. And tier three is uh, the red. Those are extreme fire hazard areas. Uh, that's Arnold, um, you know, our upper elevation foothill areas. So what you'll see from that, uh, in 2018, they focused primarily on Tier 3 as uh, a place that they would turn off power. And this year, they have included Tier 2, which essentially means that if they have a Tier 2 shutoff, uh, we're going to turn off most of the county. So the notification process that pg &E follows, uh, once they decide to, to de-energize, uh, if, if able, they provide a customer alert at the 48 hour mark prior to turn off. Uh, and again, that is when possible. Uh, 48 hours is kind of the benchmark for weather forecasting, much more than that, and it's, uh, it's not as reliable once they get up. Inside 48 hours, they can be pretty, pretty reliable. Once again, they will do a customer alert at the 24 hour mark, and again, just prior to uh, shutting the power off. The caveat to that is there's no advanced warning uh, when they turn off the power uh, as a result of a request from a state or local agency. And uh, if you want to be alerted to this process, you need to make sure that you're, update, you're updated with pg e at their uh, website there, the pg e.com slash mywildfirealerts, um, which brings me to my... Um, ruthless pitch for our alert system. If you haven't signed up for it, please do so. We can't notify you uh, if we don't have your information, much like pg &E. So uh, I believe you guys all have a flyer of that, and then there are some available on there on the uh, lecture as well. So that's what brought us to power safety shutdowns, um, and now let's talk about what we did about it. Um, our approach, we came from uh, the approach of aligning your guys' priorities um, and the CIAO's goals um, in moving through this and, and, and planning this out. Um, we are accountable uh, to you guys and the CAO uh, for creating a plan that's collaborative in nature with our internal and external partners um, and create a plan that is reasonable um, and effective to help us get through uh, a power shutoff. Um, it's strategic in nature in that we uh, planned this by being thoughtful and letting uh, the process be informed by data and feedback, um, and hopefully that will generate uh, a better plan. And by creating that better plan, we're carrying out your guys' vision uh, for emergency services. So here's what we did. Uh, we created uh, an annex or an addendum to our base emergency operations plan. Uh, you guys will be uh, seeing a resolution to adopt uh, our first emergency operation plan in about three or four years here towards the end of the month. Uh, but the PSPS annex is an addendum or an add-on to that. Um, and when we set out to write this plan, we wanted to protect life, public health, and welfare. 
We wanted to be able to maintain situational awareness, meaning know what's going on within the county um, and specifically in the areas impacted or affected by the power safety shutoff. We wanted to uh, establish thresholds or benchmarks for notifications, coordination, and activation responses. Um, and that's a cascading effect. When we decide that we're going to uh, notify uh, formally, we'll be using our Everbridge technology um, and our evacuation map technology to notify the residents. You guys are gonna know that ahead of time. Um, much like when we had the lightning uh, activation plans earlier this month, there'll be some informal communications uh, through my office to you guys about you know, hey, we think this may be on the horizon so that it doesn't sneak up on anybody. But once we uh, achieve that threshold of notifications, uh, you, there'll be an official notification not only to you guys internally uh, as well as externally. Um, once that takes place, um, we need to figure out alternative ways to communicate with our impacted communities. That will primarily take place through newspaper, through uh, the radio system, through social media, um, and again, our Everbridge platform, which pushes out email and voice and text messaging. Um, the other side of that coin is we're gonna establish and maintain communications with pg e so that we know what we are looking at, what we are facing as a county, um, as far as duration and intensity, uh, how many people are gonna be affected in the county, how long, um, and we're gonna take that information coupled with some of the things that may have caused the shutdown, temperature, wind, and things like that, and start making some decisions uh, about how we react to that. Um, it's a lot easier to survive a power safety shutdown if it's 80 degrees versus 107, as an, pure, purely as an example. Um, we are going to stay in contact with their Wildfire Safety Operations Center, that's the primary clearinghouse of information uh, to, to affected areas. Um, based on that, what we learned from them, we're gonna facilitate mass care and shelter services with uh, Health and Human Services. Um, we understand and we're going to prepare for increased informational demands, um, not only from your, our constituency, um, but from news outlets, from um, partner agencies um, and we're going to be probably uh, a leader in our community for having that information and we'll be in charge of disseminating that out so that so that we can uh, communicate effectively with our partners and then of course we're going to communicate with pg e for priority restoration of power um, just looking at that map we're going to shut down an awful lot of of our area um, and so hopefully we'll be able to stay in step with pg &E and make sure that uh, when the power comes back on, it comes on quickly uh, and effectively. So how did we carry that out? Uh, we collaborated with our internal and external stakeholders um, to assist and facilitate the creation of the PSPS response plan as well as uh, Continuity of Operations Plan, or COOP. Continuity of Operations Plan are a framework that uh, we've asked each department to create that will allow them to continue to carry out the business of whichever department it is uh, in the case of an emergency or a loss of power or you know some kind of um, external event that, that would, would interrupt normal business. So in order to do that, because uh, while in private industry, continuity of operations plans have become the norm, um, not necessarily in government, we held a couple of workshops uh, specifically for the PSPS and the COOP plan. During those workshops, you'll see two of them there, one in June, one in July. Um, we actually provided each department with a template of their continuity of operations plan um, that dovetails with the overarching PSPS plan. Um, we actually gave them a fill in the blank and we budgeted time within the workshop for them to work on them. We held two of those. Uh, those two workshops were open to our, our partners as well at the school district, at the utility districts, 
um, at the fire districts um, and our various response partners. To learn more about it, we went to, we attended the PG&E PSPS workshop up in uh, Amador County on July 17th, where we met with representatives and really learned the ins and outs of the background and what it was going to look like. And then uh, to ensure that our plan was reasonable and that we we believe that we'd be able to carry it out, we you first must exercise the plan before you fully vet it. So in order to do that, we held a tabletop exercise, again, with all of our internal and external partners, um, where we actually exercised and pretended in our mind from one table to the next that there was a power safety shutdown, what we were going to do, how we were going to incorporate those uh, continuity plans and what that might look like across all of our response partners. So the workshops gave us feedback uh, that informed the response plan. We provided those COOP planning templates um, and planning assistance during the workshops. Um, as of this morning, um, eight of our 18 departments have completed the COOP planning process, um, and you can see them here. And we continue to work with the other departments who are actively working through their plan and uh, who are um, beginning to work through their plan. At the PG&E workshop, uh, further inform the, the response plan, uh, educated our stakeholders on the likely process and provided networking opportunities for us so that we're sharing with our neighbors what and how we're, we're dealing with this and because uh, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat um, and if someone has a better idea then that was a great opportunity to share. The tabletop exercise, uh, this just talks about the it being vetted um, it's the most cost-effective way to exercise the plan without a full-scale um, shutdown of like our campus, for instance. Um, they help us route out gaps and uh, show us where we need improvement in, in the plan, both on the COOP side as well as the public safety side. And it informs our uh, individual COOP planning efforts in the sense of it gives us the chance to think about and plan for what, uh, what things we really, as a county department, what we really have to carry out during that short period of time. Um, my department, the facilities department, administration and IT, we collaborated to find a space where we can ensure that we do have some generation of power uh, to keep our government going. Obviously, if, if our county is shut down, we can't provide even uh, minimal services uh, to our residents. So we found this room. We've, we've equipped it the best that we can with uh, equipment. And in the case of a power safety shutdown, we will actually me be moving different uh, essential portions of departments in here to work. So um, on top of that, We actually did a function test of this building over a weekend with facilities, cranked up the old generator outside, um, and went room by room and uh, ferreted out what rooms had power, what did not, um, and we were pleasantly surprised to find some places that we didn't think had power that actually do. What that's going to do for us is, uh, on the administration side, since most of us are housed here in A, um, that's going to allow us to not pick up and move desks and move people into the PSPS room um, and keep them working at their normal workstation. Um, we might have to run some extension cords and do some creative uh, stuff like that, but that's going to help relieve the pressure uh, on that room. So that's the PSPS room. And then uh, in, in this planning process, we met with uh, external partners to assist and to figure out what they were doing, like Calaveras County Water District, we met with them, the City of Angels Camp, um, and uh, the volunteer 
organizations active in disaster, our VOAD guys. Um, we met with them last week. Um, and then the function test that we talked about with facilities. Last, um, we partnered with CAL FIRE to conduct uh, wildfire season preparation meetings uh, earlier this or late spring. Um, there were nine meetings in total across the county. Um, and one of those topics was the PSPS uh, shutdown. In addition to that, we partnered with some HOA groups that invited us to come and speak. Um, and we spoke just kind of uh, about our program. Obviously, it's fire season, so that was a uh, common topic was fire season and the power safety shutdown, as well as uh, alert Calaveras and our alert or our evacuation maps. So uh, we met with uh, the folks that are actually going to be affected by that. Um, and let them know what we were going to do, what we were doing to, to be prepared for that. So from here, what are the next steps? Uh, we, need, we, we need to and we are continuing to plan uh, with the other county departments to get uh, their COOP planning completed so they have an idea about where they're going to go, what essential services they need to carry out, um, and, and how we might get that done. We're going to continue uh, outreach efforts with both our internal and external stakeholders um, and, and be the best neighbor that we can, both internally and externally. Uh, we have offered um, literally private planning sessions to the various departments. If you need us to come over and help you write the plan, your COOP plan, we will do so. Um, and externally, you, you know, our external partners, our response partners, are important to us. If they aren't, um, if they don't have a continuity uh, to conduct their business, then it's going to be it's going to be a loss to us. So we're reaching out to those external partners, making sure that they have the things and the plans in place to mitigate the effects of a PSPS plan as well. Um, one of the things that we're going to go through, since we haven't yet gone through one of these is we're going to have to refine and perfect our notification systems um, once it takes place. There are going to be, you know, there's always potholes in the road, uh, and we're going to find some of those potholes. Um, I suspect that we'll find some uh, in our notification system. It'll be one of the first real-time uses of it. Um, and, you know, I'd be foolish to think that we aren't going to run into a few potholes or some bumps. Um, one of the things that's going to be difficult to do is maintaining accurate rosters for our internal as well as our, as well as our external partners. Um, our external partners, we're reaching out to our response partners, such as the Fire Chiefs Association. We're actually building Everbridge technology lists with them so that they can be notified of like what we're doing. Um, and obviously when you're talking about uh, an external or an outside entity, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to keep that up to date Internally, we face the same thing. We have 650 some odd employees, roughly. Um, and the people that come, the people that go, the people that get a new phone number or move, um, that's always a moving target. Uh, and we're working through solutions to make sure that we have the most up-to-date information uh, so our folks know what's going on uh, and we can, we can get in contact with them. Uh, when underlined and capitalized there, um, this is going to happen. Uh, I actually live in northern Yuba County um, and was a part of the June shutdown um, in that area in southern Butte County and Butte County. Um, and so I've actually gone through this as a citizen. Um, and um, it was uh, a unique set of circumstances, to say the least. Um, so when it does occur to us down here in, in the county, um, we need to be able to learn from the teachable moments that are going to be presented there um, and use those to our advantage uh, to improve our plans, not only our PSPS plan, but our continuity of operations plans. And that will help us become more resilient um, and carry out our services better during times like this. So this is, this is us, the OES contact information. That's me at the top. 
my office number, my direct office number, my email address, as well as my uh, coordinator, Chad, um, his information as well. If you're interested in following us, you can do so on Facebook, Twitter, or Nextdoor. We're probably most active at this point on Facebook. Um, it's been uh, a pretty effective outreach tool for us, um, not only for our response partners, but uh, for our residents um, and some of you guys. So that's kind of an overview of where we started and where we are and where we're going. Does anybody have any questions? Sure, there's a bunch of them. Ben, you get your light on first. <clears throat> <laughs> thank you thank you for being proactive in this it's very beneficial for the county um, I've I've got lots of questions I'm sure you've been through a lot of this I seen the gentleman uh, a few weeks back you know testing the generator and everything um, individual generator uh, what what how much load can they carry he said you mentioned that going around and testing which rooms the lights are on but once we do a move in a PSPS situation how much load are we drawing and wh what pr potential percentage of that generator goes into it? And this goes hand in hand with, you know, uh, running a generator at 70% is more beneficial in time for fuel as opposed to running at 100% because you're going to drain it down very quickly at 100% load. So w with that being said, you know, what's our fuel potential? And what are our plans for moving forward it, as these PSPSs are like, let's say they're going to last three days, but they have to go around and check each individual line before they bring it on. So it could last much longer than three days in a, in a PSPS situation. <clears throat> Do you have any information on that? Is that part of the test going forward? And so that was, uh, that was an idea that we moved forward with <clears throat> about having the smallest electrical footprint, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, a, as possible. And that means that's part of why the coop planning is so critically important for each department, because we need to know what their essential folks are, how many of them are, what kind of power that they need um, to, to continue to operate uh, at a minimum level. Um, so we are continually identifying that but when we went through uh, and designed or implemented that room, um, it is there um, and able to handle. That was one of the reasons that we actually turned the building off and then turned all the stuff on over there. They actually uh, went so uh, the IT guys who have been the the driver behind that that information. They actually moved everything over um, and were firing things up to ensure that that was taking place. Um, with the increased area of uh, power, I don't know if we're going to bump into um, the limits of that generator, um, but we do know at this point that the generator will operate the room, that it will operate other parts of the of the um, of the building, um, and as far as fuel consumption, um, it's going to be very dependent. Like. You know, you're going to get more more hours out of it if we can get it at 65 than at 95, um, and that's going to be, I think, unfortunately, uh, a very event-specific number. Much like a car trip, uh, when you're in a hurry, you get less fuel mileage than when you can <coughs> amble down the road uh, on a Sunday drive. Uh, po point of access for fuel and and plans on refueling throughout it is crucial because I've been through this at my other job. In, in, in planning and um, it's those are all crucial parts to uh, put together the plan when it comes to load generator and everything else I mean I have much more information but I'm not going to get into the nitpicky little ups and downs of it but I'd appreciate being able to talk to you a little bit more about it in depth later I'm sure you talked about this already but I just would like to know where you're at specifically we're uh, and we're aware of the the load that we're going to be putting upon uh, the fuel providers. Um, there's only one fuel provider in the area for uh, diesel and gasoline fuel. Uh, we have a few more options when it comes to propane. Um, and so it depends on the type of generator. Um, some of the diesel generators will need to be fueled uh, every 10 hours. 
Uh, the propane ones are, I won't say more efficient, but uh, generally they have a greater capacity um, and they will go a little bit longer. Um, but getting that fuel and how we're going to prioritize that fuel um, is stuff that we're still working through. John, I very got, good. Thank you. Thanks, John. I got a couple of questions for you. Um, when we go, when we go down to our essentials, firing up the generator, bringing everybody into PSPS, what are we going to do with the rest of our employees? Maybe that's a question for Al. Because um, obviously, it'll be during working hours. We've got people with jobs they won't be able to conduct. Some will, some won't. What's our strategy with our employees? So John, John mentioned that we're still working through that. We have a series of three internal PSPS workshops that start this Thursday, and will run for three straight weeks. <clears throat> we have uh, solicited the department heads for all of their feedback from their departments of what experience they had, for example, in the Butte fire when we had to shut down the communication approach. And quite frankly, what, we, what I was told about that is <clears throat> because it was one of our first big major issues, we didn't have good communication systems. So we're, we're working first through the protocol of what that'll look like. Um, right now, envisioning it, it would be something around using EverBridge and our uh, email systems to push out to department heads. If it's a work day, push out to department heads that there's a red flag warning and we need to be prepared for a shutdown. We're asking the department heads to have their own internal phone trees set up so that when they're notified that a red flag warning is in place that they'll start notify notifying their employees. I suspect when we have a PSPS shutdown, because it's uh, less convenient to have it happen when everybody's here, it'll happen on a weekend, and so we're trying to answer the question, how will all of our staff be notified? Um, so the red flag warning helps, because we'll still have power, we'll still be able to link into the system. Uh, John and or Chad and others have administrative access to EverBridge. They're working with IT on how to load every employee into EverBridge, so we'll be able to push out uh, notifications that are different from the public just to our internal staff. Um, we haven't gotten all the way through this yet, but I, I envision something like um, when we have a shutdown that all of the department heads will report somewhere, either the community room in the jail or the library because we can use ambient lighting. We'll brief there on what the information is we have out of OES, how long it may last, what assignments will be, and then department heads will go back out to each of their departments. Um, ideally, we will have set up protocols where the, when there's a shutdown, employees will come back into a central meeting area for their departments where possible, and that information will be disseminated to the departments from the department heads. Um, what can't be pushed out while we still have power? And we haven't worked this out all the way, but I anticipate that'll be a daily briefing to start the day and a daily debriefing to make sure we got all the employees in and out that were here on that particular day. We're also going to have to work through, as John mentioned, what the essential functions are. Some departments have functions that have to happen, literally have to happen, and they'll be first in the PSPS war room that we have set up, which is the old Tetra Tech room, if you haven't been in there. Um, and so we'll bring the most essential functions that have to happen, either by law or function of the county, first into that space. The others um, will have some options. There will be some that will voluntarily take vacation and not be here. There'll be others who will have to engage in um, being disaster relief workers and will have to make assignments, at th speaking hypothetically, maybe to Health and Human Services to help um, staff and work in um, uh, cooling stations or areas like that. So those assignments ideally will happen centrally every morning. We'll identify who all of our employees are, who's going to be here, who's an essential function, who's deployed as a relief worker, and who's just not here. And then we'll get together at the end of the day and count them all up and make sure that we have them. Uh, uh, all that we started with, start over the next morning as, as long as we have a shutdown. We, we should be There's sure. probably more detail than what no, you were no, hoping No, no, that's for, where I was going. I and mean, we should make sure we coordinate with our, our labor unions to make sure, because people are going to want to know if they need to show up and if they're getting paid and how that's all going to work. And we're going to want to make sure that you know, disaster worker death designation has a lot of leniency, but Judy, we want to make sure we're good. Judy's been working on that quite a bit. She's pulled down some, there There are some counties that are a little bit further ahead of us on the planning, and they tend to be more north. The planning aligned more with how these events are anticipated to happen with PG&E. From the north coast, 
into the Northern Valley and down through our area. So Shasta and Tehama County got the training from, P uh, from PG&E uh, about a month and a half before we did. So Tehama County happens to have uh, board ordinances already adopted on what will happen with personnel, payroll, those kinds of things. So we pulled some examples like that and we'll be bringing these into the work group on um, the Thursdays that we meet to discuss those very things. Communication protocols so our employees will know how and when will they be notified so they're not just waiting out there for a shutdown to happen. They'll know what the protocols are as well, provided we get them built out before an event happens. And we've tried to align the, the next three meetings in advance of an event. Um, uh, we're anticipated to be more really in the high risk time frame right around September, October. Um, so we'll, we'll certainly include you in on that planning. And before I leave that topic, I want to mention, I mean, the, the communication piece. When we went to the PG&E uh, presentation, they were quite specific that when there was a shutdown that one PG&E employee was going to contact all of the elected officials for every agency that was shut down, starting with the counties. So I took liberties ex expecting that you would rather hear from me than a PG&E worker um, about the shutdown and that a PG&E employee wouldn't be able to answer your question. So I asked them for our county to notify us and that I would coordinate the notification with you um, so that we didn't end up at the end of the line of uh, one PG&E employee, for example, trying Supervisor Toffinelli and not getting him and then moving on and then not making it back to him for two hours. I'd much rather have us focus on the communication with you to let you know we've got a red flag warning, we're on it, we're standing up the operations center or not, depending on the information we have. Um, and then you can decide as a board whether you'll, um, if we activate, if you'll come in. Um, but there's probably a piece we should discuss as well about how our communication would flow as, as well and how we're going to manage that piece that uh, obviously won't be part of the discussion. Um, I, I have one other, I have two other quick questions, sorry. Um, how are we identifying people who are most fragile, people who need electricity for, what, for, for perhaps medical purposes? How are we going to identify those people and uh, what are we going to do there? So there's a couple ways that we've been working on uh, identifying those folks. Um, Health and Human Services does have uh, an inventory of known uh, fragile folks. Um, and so they maintain that list. Um, and PG&E as well, they have a medical baseline program. Um, and we are working our way through uh, a non-disclosure agreement with them at this time um, so that we have access to that information. I suspect that that information will be more complete than uh, the self-reporting. Uh, just for the mere fact of medical baseline, they, they, PG&E actually gives them a discount, so there's, a, there's a, uh, a reward for them to identify that way. Um, so I, th I think more people will identify to PG&E than they will to, to us. Um, and, we, and we figure that with that list, you know, we will, if every day and it's over 100 degrees, we will send our disaster workers out in some form to check and make sure people are okay? Yes, sir, that is correct. Um, as well as PG&E has committed to um, a notification process, they actually, uh, for their identified uh, fragile, they uh, require contact and it, and it comes in, they'll start with uh, the home phone number if they can't get anybody on the phone number, they go to the secondary phone number if they can't do that, they actually send someone out um, and leave a door hanger and ask them to call back um, and then they circle back in on that as well. Okay. Uh, but that will be a, uh, a large amount of our disaster service folks will be out literally checking on, on, those, uh, on that population for us to ensure that uh, they, don't need, uh, they don't have an immediate medical need. Thank you. And um, one last question that will come out of my district quickly. What's PG&E going to do about the people who lose uh, thousands of dollars of meat and supplies in their freezers after five days? Uh, that I do not know. I, I won't be pretentious to uh, to answer for PG&E. Are they PG talking about it at all? Uh, uh, they have been talking about it, and I don't believe they intend to have any kind of reimbursement. I, 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 I've heard if there is a reimbursement, there's a cap on it, so that's why I went and bought a generator for my freezers specifically. Sure. I mean, if you're a print stopper and you picked up a couple of pigs at fair, you do not want that thing going down. Yeah, that, we're going to have a good barbecue <laughs> down here. <laughs> Um, and, and that's one of that brings up a good point. We, we have been 
one of our internal partners is uh, Economic Development, um, who sits next to us, uh, so we're co-located in an office. Um, and we've been very supportive of each other um, and in working with um, the Health and Human Services side um, that regulates you know, temperature of the goods and how long they can last and things like that. And that's why the framework that you saw is, I don't want to say vague, but it's scalable. You know, if we have a 24-hour shutdown and it happens on a Sunday, um, the only people that are probably going to be at work are, are me and, and my staff. We're going to stand up the EOC to make sure that uh, the power is back on, and if it gets delayed, then we're going to move and, and scale it out. Now, if it's Wednesday um, and it's going to be four or five days long, that's going to drastically affect uh, the, the footprint of our initial operation. So the plan's meant to be scalable. Um, and to address uh, the size of the event. Okay, for for no plans of reimbursement from pg &E. So, okay, thank you. So if I might touch on something while, while we're there, John mentioned the scalability. It's going to be day-to-day decision-making when there's a PSP event. If it's 85 degrees and it's windy, that's going to be, w wind is going to be one of the key factors. Right. But if it's 85 degrees and we don't have AC, we'll be able to you know bring staff in longer. Um, if it's 107 degrees getting down to 92 at night, we're going to ha have an entirely different protocol on how we're going to have to handle with the department heads, how we mon monitor temperature, um, when we send people home, whether we're going to adjust hours and start at 6 and work till 10, and, and, and if we'll even be able to manage that in a, in a work appropriate way for our staff. So, you know, we're, we're contemplating that. We just can't plan it out because we don't know when it'll happen, but I think that's why we'll need daily briefings to assess what is the situation on this day, how long might we be able to work, what are essential functions, and how are we going to make sure that when we go to go home, at we, and I'll use the, the, you know, the larger we, when everybody goes home at the end of the day, did we shut down with the same amount of people that came in in the morning? And that's going to be a big priority for, for us daily. And it, it literally will just be day to day and, and until we get through it. Um, that's the scalability piece on the on our side of it. Supervisor Mills, you've been patient. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I think it's very important that we use you as our single point of contact to this board. If you feel that you need to call an emergency meeting or that you need to have information dissected out to the group, it's rather than overwhelm John or overwhelm other people with questions, it'd be better for us to just come in through the CAO's office and and use that as our as our vehicle. Um, secondly, the fire districts have asked to be sure that they're included in uh, where are the elderly, where are the uh, indigent in their areas, especially for those that are oxygen dependent. Um, it's going to be very important for them because, as you know, Copper Fire and Abbott's Pass, they have paramedics, so they could uh, go out and do a lot of additional work that normal districts could not do. But yeah. uh, I think there's going to have to be an integration of uh, the information with them as well. If there needs to be MOU signed or whatever, uh, I'd ask that it, that get done. Um, the other thing is, is that could you speak for a moment to those people who do not live in Calaveras County at what address they're supposed to use? Uh, we need their home address or their address in the county, uh, which may not be their home address. It may be their, uh, their cabin address or their vacation home address, uh, but we need to know primarily where that is because that's going to be the basis of their notification. Um, if they're in Murphy's, they don't need to know necessarily about a fire in Valley Springs unless it's covered a lot of ground. Uh, but if they live in Valley Springs um, and they're worried about their cabin in Murphy's, we, we need to know which address, and most of them don't have to in the same county. Most of them are outside the county and then come up here. Uh, but we need, the, we need the address in the county so that we can notify them regarding that particular address. And I know you've had some people sign up that use their some addresses Bay in San Jose or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stockton. Yeah. Um, and we're not going to have a uh, very accurate emergency information for those locations. Thank you, John. Thank you. Mr. Stopper? Um, can you bring up the Calvers fire threat ma map again, please? Yes, sir. It's a ways back. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, uh, it's it's in yellow up there for, for your tier two, um, orange on my map, and then red's your tier three, which is your highest prone areas. Now, I'm assuming the white areas are what would be a tier one? Yes. Those and and okay, beyond that, in the Valley Springs area between Party and New Hogan, you're showing a substantial area of white there, and even down through Rancho Calaveras, Calaveras there near Hogan, not in its entirety, are those on a different grid, and will those be in power when the rest is shut down? So what uh, I found through my personal experience uh, from one grid to the next, literally those grids may run on one side of the street. So if you live on 122 Don't Walk <coughs> Street, you may have power. And if you live on the other side mm -hmm. of Walk Street at 123, you may not. I, those, I dealt with it in that yeah. area quite a bit. Um, yeah. So the other, uh, the other variable in, in my inability to answer that question accurately <laughs> is that uh, depending on the transmission lines, because also this year they began shutting down transmission lines. So they may have a transmission line that runs through this red area here, but carries power to here. And if they shut it up, the transmission line off here, there's not gonna be any power there. Under, understood, yeah. And you're very right that one side of the street and not the other because parts of Lock Antenna per se in Gary's district are on one part of the grid and then the other parts are on a different entirely entire grid. So I, 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 I see it consistently throughout the summer. One grid's a little more volatile than the other. That's the, dis the distinction on this map though, is this: these are the threat levels. Uh, they're not necessarily a shutdown map. When there's an incident, mm -hmm. we'll be able to log in and see the actual shutdown map, yeah. Yeah. which is what makes in each incident a bit fluid too, because we might have parts of our county operation that because not everybody's here on campus that actually have power and others that don't. And so we've been working with partners. Um, as an example, some of our departments are working without a county partner so that we could send staff there. As an example, uh, probation has made arrangements with San Joaquin County that if their power's out, they can send folks down there and do you know court type work that's electronic based. Um, we've also worked with some of our partners like uh, Angels Camp as an example. If they're on and we're off, can we send essential personnel there to, as, as you know, they have a very big city hall and they can take on a lot. They, obviously they don't, but they can take on if, if we had to send some essential staff there, they're willing to do that. Um, so we're looking for options on where we might be able to send people pending the shutoff map and once we get to see that particular incident and what's shut off. Thank you, gentlemen. Good. I can see you're really doing your homework, and I appreciate the time you put into this situation. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Res Calloway had questions. PG&E is saying that they want the public to sign up on their notification system. So what message is that sending? We're trying to encourage people to do Calaveras Alert, and yet PG&E is saying sign up on theirs. So... Are we saying you should sign up on both, or is Calaveras Alert going to take the lead on behalf of the residents of Calaveras? So my recommendation would be to sign up for both. Make sure that your, ac your information is accurate with both. Um, and the reason for that is there may be a power shutoff that is, does not rise to the level of a PSPS. Uh, a drunk driver hits a pole and 500 residents are affected by a loss of power because of that pole. PG&E will, will actually use the same technology that we're using, uh, GIS mapping, to contact the people within that service area um, with their information that PG&E holds. So by signing up with PG&E or making sure your information is correct with them, you'll get those notifications that we won't. We don't get notified in those, in those circumstances. Most of the time we know just because of our operational area and our partners, um, but that direct notification would come from PG&E. But for PSPS, I mean, it's a whole lot different than a, somebody hits a power pole. Right, um, and so the flip side of that coin is, is say we have some other event that's not a PSPS, um, if they are signed up with PG&E and not with us, they won't receive those notifications much like the power outage for a pole being down, we're not gonna notify, but PG&E will. 
So they're, they're not interchangeable completely, and that's why I recommend both. So if it's a PSPS, we will use Everbridge? Yes. Even we if will. it's 48 hours ahead of time? pg e is going to push out their message uh, 48 hours ahead of time. Um, we will probably be somewhere in that neighborhood the first time, um, but we may not use Everbridge to do that first notification because at that point we'll still have power. So I'm really not clear on what to, what we say to the public. I mean, every time I'm out, it's, oh, you know, have you signed up for Calaveras Alert, Calaver? So now we should be saying Calaveras Alert and PG&E? In the narrow circumstance of PSPS, yes, ma'am. They, they should be updating their information with Okay, both. so when we notify people through Calaveras Alert, are we doing it by zone? Because you mentioned, you know, shelter services and so forth. That goes by zone. So will people be notified by zone then? I hope so. The reason I say I, I hope so, pg &E has promised that they are going to push out um, information packages to us uh, in the form of a shape file. Um, that shape file will be able to take it and lay it over our evacuation map, and that will determine uh, the zone that you're speaking of. Uh, of each, or by zone, you're talking about the two by two mile square in our. That uh, little blue yes. guy on my, yep. my page, whatever. So we'll actually take what pg &E sends us, lay it over our evacuation system. Well, right. our awesome IT guys will. Um, and then we'll know who is signed up within that area, and we'll push the message out to them that way. The, the main point is, is the Calaveras Alert is our branded communication right. system. We, we're the only ones who have control over that. We don't have any control over the information that pg and &E has. Yeah. To get the best, most updated information, it's best if they're, and, and in the case of a PSPS, that they're both on pg and &E and our notification system. However, our notification system goes well beyond PSPS and will be used for any number of other issues, whether it's uh, fire, flood, um, potentially heat warnings if, if the, they became extreme. So it's our only way in a PSPS to be able to push out to the county countywide, here's what you need to, to know. And, and same for, for fire. And pg and &E taking no responsibility, whether they start it or not, for notifying their customers when there's a fire, um, unless there happens to be a PSPS shut down along with it. And so our system is going to be far more robust and a better communication system for our citizens. So if we have a heat wave and we want to tell people where their shelters, we have to do it through Calaveras Alert and through the zone system. Yes, ma'am. Um, and other outlets. We, we can utilize more than just Calaveras Alert, but Calaveras Alert would be uh, one of the preferred methods. So when do they decide if it's a transmission shutdown or if it's just a distribution shutdown. Do, you, do they explain that? They, they did not um, in the sense of if it is in uh, an area that, is, that they decide to de-energize, it is my understanding that they are going to de-energize both transmission and distribution. That's significantly different audience. I mean, it's a much bigger audience. Yes, ma'am. Um, and, and can affect people that normally wouldn't experience any kind of shutdown, like down in the valley, like, you know, the middle of Stockton or, or Galt. Um, and if the transmission line is large enough, even farther. And that, um, that, and, lies, and a, I'm sorry, go ahead. that lies the, the problem of the length of time it will be off. If the event is 24 hours or 48 hours, and you have a transmission line up here and it carries it all the way down here and past, they have to check all those lines before they turn anything on at all. So it's not like it was just this area right here and a transmission line was here down Paloma Road or whatever. It, it, you, you, they, they don't have that much to check, but the further away and the larger transmission and how far it goes, it could be a week and a half before they turn it back on. And PG&E, they have to lay human eyes on every bit of line. Yes. 
-hmm. Now, sure. to that end, uh, an important thing to know is, say at 9.30, the wind event or the red flag warning ceases, um, 9.30 p.m., the wind subside. Uh, they are not going to begin those inspections until daylight the next day. Um, now, to pg &E's credit, they do uh, invest significantly in resources. Um, in my experience with the actual power shutdown, there were troublemen uh, stacked in every parking lot nearby. Um, and as soon as they said, okay, begin inspecting, they did. Uh, they had uh, as many as 18 helicopters on standby. Um, and I think they only used about three or four. Um, but they, they, once the decision was made to re-energize, it was about four and a half hours uh, to, to re-energize before that, when that inspection took place. It was, uh, they put a lot of resources to it. So that being said, we do have some pretty rugged country um, that uh, is gonna be accessible only by air or um, you know, walking it or a UTV. Um, and depending on the weather conditions, there's, there's a lot of moving parts behind that, behind re-energy re-energizing those lines. Um, and that's why we need to be in lockstep with, with uh, PG&E and abreast of that situation so we can make decisions based on what they think their time frame's gonna be. Yeah, I have, um, I share the um, concerns that Supervisor Garamendi and Mills brought up. Um, there, in your statements about how we can contact the elderly or people that are in need, um, oxygen or what have you, but there are a lot of elderly people that not that aren't on PG&E's list because they don't utilize any of that. There's a lot that aren't on our list that could be sitting there for a week not knowing what's going on in, in heat. So I have some concerns with that and being able to get this information out to them. And the other critical part to that is that it's very critical that we maintain power here at the county, especially for OES and the vital um, departments that we need to keep open in that time. With that concern, um, uh, you spoke of testing generators. How many generators did you test or do we have? Do we have just one generator? Do we have two, five? That particular test was for the generator for this building that's out mm -hmm. inside. The big old diesel one? Yes. Yeah, the ones, uh, yeah. Yeah, but and, there are, and there then what we've done as well with that is, uh, based on that, we've identified the need to make sure that that stays in operation and in operating order, and we fire it up actually once a month. Well, the concern I have is, and it was brought up by Supervisor Stopper, is many people are buying generators for this particular um, public safety power turn off shutdown. Um, you, you mentioned only one fueling company here, um, and I'm sure they are going to be getting calls from people to come fill their generators and keep them stocked. My concern is uh, setting up a program as to how long our generator will run on a fill up and how soon we have them coming back or making a phone call. We don't want it to run out of fuel and shut us down. Right. And it could be at the most critical time that we need to be running. And then we're running around and we don't have a generator, we don't have power because the guy that's responsible driving the fuel truck is fueling somewhere else at the time. So it's very critical that that program is set up to make sure um, we have um, a program that maintains the fuel and maintains the power on here um, because that's the notification to everybody and everything that's going on. Correct. And one of the things that we're looking at, unfortunately, um, is going outside our normal sphere um, and finding a vendor that is willing to come from uh, basically far away um, to, to ensure that we have an alternate source uh, of, of fuel. Um, because the fuel guys, the one fuel company around here is going to be busy. They are. That's uh, yes. yes. Absolutely so. I, and just to add to that real quick, I appreciate it. Um, uh, contracting with those and get, getting priority in the contract because we, we are a part of the emergency services. 
the power outage may not be the only thing we're going through. If we have a fire start anyways from something else during one of these events, we need to be capable of outgoing. Sorry for interrupting here. Go ahead. Yeah. And, uh, and to that end, um, with our response partners, including Cal Fire and some of the other fire districts here, um, we may be able to lean on our external partners uh, to assist in that uh, in, you know, I mean, literally beg borrowing and, and shuttling fuel between places depending on, on the scope of what's taking place. So that's part of the important part about building those relationships with our external partners is um, identifying that where we can share resources and where we can help each other out. So, so we are working on external contracts that would, <laughs> to the extent that we can, get that priority. Uh, your first question was about generators. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I saw Stan come in. Um, Stan and Patrick Martin deserve a lot of credit for being out in front of this. Um, Stan's been far more than just an IT guy and thinking about this, but uh, Patrick's been very pro proactive. Um, we've purchased some generators. We've gotten switches on buildings so that we can plug in. I'll get the exact number and I'll send it in a written update. Uh, but it won't just be this building. That's not the only generator we have. That just happens to be the most significant one because we have uh, the PSPS war room or whatever we're going to call it on that. And then the number one priority generator is the one that will run um, our IT system. So all of our network will get the priority on fuel and we'll establish a fuel priority on down from that. So our communication systems as best they can with the lack of power we'll still have ways to push out information to the public provided um, and of course stands in the room if I say any wrong anything that's inaccurate he'll correct it but that's our first priority so that we can link with our public as best we can and then we'll move out from there on a, a legally mandated services and then essential services and that's how we'll prioritize the the fuel as well if we get limited well, it's, it's critical, not so much with the gasoline engines, but a diesel engine, if it runs out of fuel, it's not just put fuel in it and start it up. Mm -hmm. it, it takes, you know, you have to bleed everything out and you have to get the system full. So it's not just turn it back on. It's going to take some time. So, okay. And if you could make the wineries a top priority, <laughs> that would be the of the county. You don't, I don't that think they're included in shutdowns. Center, it's underground, it's cool, there's beverages. I would argue that the wine industry is about a quarter of the cattle industry, but cows don't need air conditioning. Yeah. Uh, we, could, we could burn cows, yeah. <laughs> if no further questions, John, thank you very much for all your work. Yeah. Appreciate thank it. You. I think we all appreciated the input. Oh, I appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. This is not an action item, but public comment. Al, you've been standing there patiently. It's uh, Al Sagawa, Taxpayer Association. I think we're doing a great job for uh, our county offices and our emergency services. Um, but there is there's only a little comment. Ben, ben Stopper hit the nail on the head. He bought an emergency generator. We've got about 12,000, well, more than 12,000 um, households in our county. At least there's 12,000 cable subscribers. And it seemed like every one of those should have a backup generator. And what I'm learning so far, it looks like it's better fueled by propane than gasoline or diesel. So um, it might be an opportunity now to gather information for the taxpayers and the voters and the public about what are the sources and costs for a generator and how long do you think it would how long a delay before they can have one installed? In other words, get on top of the personal, uh, of the private generator situation because for the people, that's the most important thing. If you turn off power for a day or two and they have an emergency generator that goes on automatically, no big deal, no problem. But people that like to cook and then put aside some of the delicious food they make so they can have it another day and then lose everything in the freezer, because they, don't, they didn't think about getting an emergency generator, hey, that's pretty serious. So if you can possibly work with PG&E, get the experts to provide information for the public like this uh, so that they can make intelligent decisions on getting their own generator. That's 12,000 generators. That's pretty serious. 
Thank you. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Seeing none, I'll thank John again. Thank you very much for your work, and we will continue on with the meeting. We may take a two-minute break. That way you guys get set up. Welcome back to the August 13th Board of Supervisors meeting. We are going to be doing uh, item 26, 27, and 28. They're all related, so we will, um, the clerk will read off the items, and then I will open a single public hearing so we could hear them all at the same time and the applicant and then when we close the public hearing we will then return and vote on each of these items madam clerk item 26 is from the planning department to conduct a public hearing and adopt an ordinance approving zoning amendment 2018-048 for apn 054-014 019 located at 90 Rock Creek Road Copperopolis from C2 General Commercial to C2 PD General Commercial Plan Development for continue LP item 27 is from the Planning Department to conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution approving plan development permit 2018-048 for APN 054-014-019, located at 90 Rock Creek Road, Copperopolis, for continue LP. And item 28 from the Planning Department is to adopt a resolution approving 2018-048 TPM for APN 054-014-019, located at 90 Rock Creek Road, Copperopolis, for continue LP. Thank you very much. I will now open a hearing on item 26, 27, 28. Mr. Mauer. I'll just turn it right over to my capable staff, Madeline Flandreau. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madeline Flandreau, Planner 2. Um, just to reiterate, there are three actions for project 2018-048. Uh, Items 26, 27, and 28 are linked. There are three separate resolutions for each action, um, one for each action, and I'll present the project in its entirety, um, presenting each action in order of approval. So project number 2018-048 is a zoning amendment, plan development permit, and tentative parcel map for continue LP. The applicant is requesting approval of a zoning amendment from C2 General Commercial to C2-PD, which is um, adding the plan development combining zone, as well as a plan development permit and a tentative parcel map to allow for a condominium conversion of an existing 20,000 square foot commercial structure into a single commercial condominium. Uh, no changes or improvements are proposed to the existing structure and no additional development is proposed. Project location, the parcel uh, APN 054-014-019 is located at 90 Rock Creek Road in Copperopolis at the northwest corner of the intersection of State Route 4 and Rock Creek Road. The aerial view, uh, the 6.36 acre developed lot um, contains the commercial structure, which is surrounded by asphalt parking. Uh, the structure contains 10 suites, which are currently occupied with commercial tenants and is served by an on-site well and on-site septic system. This is a photo, uh, Google Street image of the encroachment onto Rock Creek Road. Zoning and land use, the adjacent parcel to the north is zoned AP, Agricultural Preserve, and the parcels across Rock, Creek, across Rock Creek Road and Highway 4 are zoned AP, General Agriculture. The parcel to the west um, is developed with a single family residence and commercial, industrial, and residential uses on Main Street in Copperopolis are directly across State Route, Route 4 to the southeast. The existing general plan land use designation for the parcel is Copperopolis Community Center. And the proposed designation is commercial. 
The proposed condominium conversion is consistent with the general plan in that it is a continued commercial use that is permitted by right. One of the purposes of the plan development combining zone is to provide flexibility for condominium development. Pursuant to County Code Chapter 1750, the PD combining zone is required for condominiums which utilize density transfer and common areas to create parcels that are smaller than the minimum size permitted by the general plan. The plan development performance standards of Chapter 1750, such as parking and landscaping, are applicable to this project. So in order to ensure that the current use is meeting the standards of the plan development combining zone, a plan development permit is also being processed with this application. The site is developed and no additional development is being proposed, therefore it is already in compliance with the performance standards of the C2 zone. In 2006, a parking and landscaping plan was approved which demonstrated compliance with the county's requirements for the C2 zone. The performance standards for the PD differ slightly um, with regards to square footage of landscaping required. However, the existing landscaping that was approved in 2006 far exceeded the requirements under the C2 standards um, and therefore it meets the requirements of Chapter 1750 for the plan development permit. Parcel maps um, are required for the creation of a commercial condominium pursuant to the California Commercial and Industrial Common Interest Development Act. In addition, the project must comply with the requirements of County Code Chapter 16.01, which states that a parcel map shall be required for a subdivision when the land consists of a parcel or parcels having commercial zoning, frontage on a county or state road, no dedications or improvements are necessary and that the Planning Commission finds that the road is in standard condition. This project meets all of those requirements and the Commission did make the finding at the public hearing on July 11th that Rock Creek Road, being a county maintained road, is in standard condition. The conversion of an existing structure to a condominium is exempt from CEQA pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15301 for existing facilities part K which states that the division of existing multifamily or single family residences into common interest ownership and subdivision of existing commercial or industrial buildings where no physical changes occur which are not otherwise exempt. The circulation of the project did not result in any agency concerns and revealed no environmental effects. So in conclusion, the proposed condominium conversion would convert an existing permitted land use being a 20,000 square foot commercial structure into a single condominium unit. No physical changes or change in land use are proposed. So the subdivision would remain in compliance with the zoning classification and the general plan land use designation for the parcel. Access to the site is ad adequate without need for improvements. In addition, the Planning Commission voted in favor of the project as proposed. There was no public comment on the project and the applicant was present and agreed with the favorable recommendation. And I believe the um, owner of Continue LP, Jay Lang, is here today if you have additional questions for him. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Mr. Lang, would you have anything you'd like to say? Yes, I am Jay Lang, Continue LP. I just want to say, to Peter and Madeline, thank you for their tolerance of me <laughs> pushing, pushing this through and their creative ways of trying to figure out how this process was supposed to go together. So that's all I want to say. And they've done a great job. Thank you. Questions from the board? Supervisor Cowley? In the conversion process, when you go into condominiums, is, is there a maintenance agreement for the paving, the landscaping, the outside, so forth? There will be a common area maintenance agreement, yes, for all the common area maintenance and all Right. That. So does that become part of the record, or is it that we just, no offense, we just take his word for it that it's going to happen? Is there a way that it's codified? 
I mean, if it was in there and I missed it, my apologies. Um, we don't have a condition that requires that. Um, it's certainly something we could add if you felt it was necessary. Um, in this case, I think it's to the benefit of the property owner if he wishes to lease out the um, or, or sell the um, the building to have, you know, to maintain the, the, um, the, I the common area, the parking lot landscaping. Uh, um, if we want to add a condition, we can certainly craft something that would. Um, I mean, I understand that. It's, it's to his benefit, but in 10 years or 15 years and something happens in the landscape and it's, well, we're still basing it on a handshake and his or her, whatever, good intentions. Oh. It's like having road, road agreements on private roads. There will That's be a board instead of, I'm sorry, I don't mind interrupting, sir. There, there will be, oh, I'm sorry. There will be a, a board established of the homeowners, um, or not homeowners, I'm sorry, property right, owners, right. <laughs> uh, that will be there, that actually will be in charge of the maintenance and, and agreement and going on there. And I. I can't say this for sure because I don't know, but I, I understood that the state in itself required that as part of a, the process. And quite honestly, I, I can't. can't. I mean, I wouldn't that. buy. I wouldn't buy one if I didn't have an agreement for maintenance and care for the property for the future and everything else. But there but is. there but there is none. If I'm hearing Mr. Mauer correctly, and I mean, I can't answer if the state requires it. But we have not uh, recommended that a condition. Uh, to that effect be uh, applied um, to this. I, again, is the, the, the Subdivision Map Act, is, uh, the um, Common Area uh, Act, has a lot of requirements that the state mandates for uh, developers of condominium you know, units, both for commercial as well as residential. Um, they do have to have uh, agreements between property owners. Um, I don't know that we have the uh, capacity to be reviewing those types of agreements uh, at our level, we can certainly require that they uh, submit the, the maintenance agreement um, to the county before it's recorded to ensure that, that something like that exists. I like. guess my, I'm looking at the fact that we have, you know, parcel splits and subdivisions and roads are private, and we've learned from a lot of experience that who's going to maintain that road. And um, I'm just trying to look to the future so something is avoided. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't buy it unless I knew, I but you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's easy for us to say today, there's a project in front of us. I'm just thinking in 15 or 20 years when something needs to be done, well, who does it? Or board members leave? Or there's an internal fight? And, and unless it's codified in some way, um, that, that's just my recommendation. But, you know, that's, I and guess I if you don't want to do it and... The county doesn't care and the supervisor doesn't care? Well, I can assure you I will do it because one, it comes back on me in the future if something happens without an agreement for maintenance and common areas. But if you sell the project, you know, it's sold off and we're now 15 years down the road and the plants have all died and the landscaping and I want to sell my condominium building and I'm, I just, I voiced my opinion. I think it's not good business not to, not to have one. And I thoroughly agree. And again, I'm not sure of the, I believe the requirements of the state are that they have to have one since there's common area walls. But there's, Mr. Maurer, the, 
the requirements are if he was building from scratch. He's not building from scratch. He's doing a conversion. Right. So, you know, it's pretty now, and it's nice now, and everybody's happy now. But we all know we've had enough of them in front of us that things happen. And unless you have rules of the road for such an expensive comp <coughs> excuse me, complex project, that's... And just so you're aware, Supervisor Calvary, there, there is two more buildings that were proposed to be approved to actually be built there also. So it's not just in that one. There's a whole project of it. So I just, but I, I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there other questions from the board? Then we will move on to public comment on for the hearing. Yeah, Al Segala. I'm a real estate broker, and I think there is requirements by the state and under the Subdivision Map Act in order for him to have the um, the uh, parcels recorded because they. He'll be break. He's actually subdividing the property, even though it's parts of the building, and, uh, and normally the county doesn't get concerned with that because it's covered by state law, and it can't be recorded without what they call a white paper. So uh, I don't think there's concern. Though I do understand your your thinking, and uh, uh, if there w if that weren't true, there could be a problem in the future. Thank you. Ms. Mills? Vicki Mills, um, I understand he has a water source with a well on the property. My question is, is that well going to be able to handle the sprinkler system that he's going to have to do? Or is he going to have a secondary, um, say, storage tank or something for the sprinkler system? Because it's state law, everything has to be sprinkled now, sprinklers now. Thank you, Ms. Carter. I, I think that, um, there should be an agreement uh, between all parties, like most condominiums have, where um, the property is kept up to date as a group, rather than, I don't know the proper terminology, I'm sorry, but it should be kept up as a, a group. There's some, some kind of organization that takes care of the landscaping and the outdoors. Thank you. So any further public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Any final comments, Mr. Maurer? Um, so I agree with uh, Supervisor Callaway that typically with the residential subdivision, we want to make sure that roads are maintained, particularly those that are you know, serve a, a public interest of you know, public safety. Um, in this case, it's um, not a whole lot different than we would have with the approval of a new commercial building where we require landscaping up front, but we don't go back and monitor their landscaping 5, 10, 20 years later on that. Um, we could put a condition in uh, if you felt appropriate, and I'll just offer this as an option. A common area maintenance agreement shall be recorded concurrently with the recording of the parcel map. Um, you know, that's something that you felt was appropriate. We could certainly add that condition just to ensure that whatever can, whatever maintenance agreement he has, we record it so it's, a, you know, it's part of, of, of the record so that the, any other owner of that parcel, it's really, it's, it's between the, the different property owners involved. So if, if there's, in this case, one building with a, one owner and the rest of the land is, is owned by some, another party, uh, then um, to ensure that there's, some fair share of the maintenance requirement there. Uh, that's what we'd be looking at. Um, as far as the sprinklers, uh, the applicant did uh, receive um, a letter from the fire district. We received a letter from the fire district when we first uh, circulated this project uh, several months ago. Uh, all of the communication from all of the agencies was relayed to the owner. 
uh, so they have a copy of that. There were um, concerns that the fire district had raised uh, as far as future expansion of the, of the site. There's room for additional buildings. Uh, since the original submittal, the application has been modified so that it's only the existing building that we're dealing with at this point in time. Um, I don't know the fire codes if enough to know if, if this conversion would require uh, retrofitting of the, um, the structure, but whatever needs to be done would have has to be done on the fire code. That has nothing to do with what um, you know, we're doing today on, on this as far as the parcel map is concerned. So if there are changes necessary to the building because of the condominium conversion due to the fire codes or building codes, that's going to have to be done regardless of, of what, we, what happens today. Supervisor Mills, your district. Thank you. I think that uh, state law is fairly well written when it comes to common areas and the responsibilities on subdivision map acts. We don't need to add an additional uh, statement in here to accomplish the goals that the state has already clearly stated. Uh, secondly, when it comes to building codes, fire codes, whatever, that's that's separate from the land use. That, that's another conversation for another day. So, uh, you know, we're only talking about the land, the land use designation, the zoning, and, and that's it. And whether or not uh, this fits within the requirements. And it does fit within those requirements to do anything different. Uh, uh, that, that'd be totally counterproductive uh, to the to the goals. So, uh, if you're looking for a motion, or if there's any further comment, oh, we're still in the hearing. I'm going to close up the hearing when we're done. Thank you for your comments. Anything else, Councilor? You good? I was just going to chime in on um, many of the things after the entitlement is is awarded. The uh, I see this as being similar to like a homeowners association. There are commercial owners associations that are created and are vetted through the, um, the Department of Real Estate prior to any of the condominiums being sold. So there are uh, CCNRs for commercial condominiums that are put into place and a lot of times those go through those the, the issues that were brought up by Supervisor Callaway. And that is a process that is done at the Department of Real Estate. Mr. Stop. you have a statement? Very well, I will. I just concur with Mr. Mills that these other things have no bearing on our decision, so go ahead and do it, Jack. The hearing is closed. We will return. Um, now we will take on each of these items and uh, have a vote. Number 26. Do we need to read them again, Madam Clerk? Or? Oh, if we don't need to, we can just call it. Okay, call it. We've already read them once. So item 26, which is um, zoning amendment. Is there a motion or further discussion? I'll move the item. Item is moved by Supervisor Mills. Is there a second? Second. Second by Supervisor Stopper. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. Move to item 27, which is the resolution for the permit. Is that correct? Resolution for the plan development permit. For the plan development permit. Is there any discussion? Excuse me. Do I need to have public comment on each of these items? No. Already did. Already did through the hearing. Okay, good. So, is there a resolution? Is, is, there, a, is there a motion? I will move the item. Item is moved by Supervisor Mills. Second. Second, Second by Supervisor Stopper. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5 0. Item 28. Um, another resolution. So for the parcel map. For the parcel map. Thank right. you. Sorry, <laughs> I can't see these things. My eyes are blurred. So twenty-eight. Is there any further discussion or a motion? I'll move the resolution approving the tentative parcel map. Thank you very much. Moved by Supervisor Mills. Is there a second? Second. Second by Supervisor Stopper. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Passes five zero. Thank you, Thank for you very much. Thank you very, very much for the presentation. We will take a two minute break. Make it three. Welcome back to the board of supervisors meeting. We are on item twenty nine. 
is from the Clerk of the Board of Supervisors, the appointment of applicants to serve on various citizen advisory boards, committees, and commissions. Today you have before you two applications for two separate vacancies. The first is on the Parks and Recreation Commission. It's one vacancy for a term expiring 12-31-2019 for a District 3 representative. We have an application from Mark Hall. The other is for the Public Educational and Governmental Television, or PEG TV Commission, one vacancy for a term expiring 12-31-2022 for a District 2 representative, and we have an application from Bill Vieira. Questions from the board on this item? Any public comment on this item? Very well, bring it back to the board. Is there a motion or further discussion? I'll move this item. Moved by Supervisor Toffinelli. Is there a second? Second. Second by Supervisor Calloway. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. Supervisor announcements. In compliance with AB 1234, chaptered as Government Code Section 53232.3D, board members shall provide brief reports on meetings they attended at the expense of the local agency at the next regular meeting of the legislative body. This report is required to include meetings attended for which there has been expense reimbursement such as mileage, meals, lodging, etc., but may also, at the board member's discretion, include any other meeting attended by the supervisor on behalf of the county. Supervisor Callaway, would you like to go first this time? Nothing to report. Supervisor Mills? I'll be meeting with uh, Supervisor Roder for this Thursday. And uh, next Thursday, I've got a meeting with Army Corps to. Uh, Go over the spillway at uh, New Maloney's. So uh, we'll ask Mr. Alt if he would like to attend as well, if he's interested. But it's only to put the public at ease that uh, this, this is not the Oroville spillway and uh, everything is fine. But we're going to have a chance to look at it firsthand with a state geologist. That's all I have. Thank you. Supervisor Stopper? <clears throat> Last week, Wednesday, I sat in on the uh, co co COG meeting for uh, both. Bo both our other supervisors were uh, absent, so I got to bear the load for both of them. Um, she paid double? <laughs> no, unfortunately. But uh, it, it, it's going well, and I uh, do appreciate all the work that these two gentlemen have put in on the past with COG and everything, and uh, I'm very comfortable with the work they're doing over there. Um, and then also, um, I would like to do a poll of the board. Um, just for a discussion in the future um, on how we're going to proceed in the future with uh, um, direction of the board, uh, how we're going to dele delegate that out in the future. So as once the board is given direction and whether or not any one supervisor has the ability to give direction on their own and we should have that discussion in the future i don't i'm not saying we need to have this tomorrow but there's uh issues sometimes that happen where uh some things you know you can do request of a department but there's other things that a direction at one supervisor it should be direction of the board in its consensus and then also once direction has been given how do we follow up on accountability so that, you know, uh, let's say the CAO has purview over that, um, and how would we insert that discussion into a board meeting in the future, possibly on a study session? Hmm. I would. Didn't, 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 didn't you all already do something like that? Don't you have, where if you spend more than four hours has to be approved by the board or depending yeah i what just um i well um 
One, I want to caution the board of getting into much substantive discussion here since this is purely a poll, but I did want to remind the board that we this might be something about up, um, potentially updating the board rules and procedures because the current board rules and procedures, Rule 43, uh, discusses board member referrals to staff. And um, it says board members should work through the county administrative officer on all referrals to staff and on placing items of interest on the agenda for future consideration. If the county administrative officer determines the referral constituent request and or project involves a significant amount of staff time, historically we've kind of tied four hours to that, but we took that specific time limit out of the board rules the last time we updated it. Um, it goes on to say other resource commitments and or is a departure from established county or departmental policy, the county administrative officer may pull the board and or agendize an informational item to request direction and approval from the board prior to starting work. Um, and then board members are encouraged to discuss referrals which may require significant resources with the chair and the county administrative officer. So that's what our current board rule says so if we want to have something more formalized as far as tracking and how items are brought forward for um, accountability we can certainly discuss updating the board rules and rule 43 in particular to meet the board's desires supervisor stopper is that are you suggesting that we take a look at the, the rules or maybe <coughs> narrow it down a little bit better our focus so we figure out what the decision item is um yeah maybe narrow down our focus a little bit more i mean the i understand where county council is saying fo the rule 43 and how it applies um i think that somewhat addresses some of my concerns but i may maybe uh maybe revisiting the rules but i don't want to redo the entire rules once again i but uh, there's there's different ways to address this and uh, that's why i'm looking on consensus how we want to address it and not getting into specifics so much on that well you Mr. Stopper, i'm i'm i know i survived doing the rules before i still have a little ptsd from that so <laughs> Excuse my hesitance, but maybe uh, maybe we could work together and we could define narrow down a little bit more so we could get to where you're trying to get to. Uh, abs to absolutely, I, this isn't something that, that needs to be about. done tomorrow. But you know, I think for accountability and some of the other issues in the future, that this this is a good discussion. So okay. I would I could appreciate let's bringing it back next time as a poll after we refine it. Yeah, let's you and I sit down and we'll talk a little bit more closely about what you exactly. We're trying to get and we'll figure out how to make that i appreciate i appreciate it supervisor toffinelli um i have nothing to report i spent no county money <laughs> thank you i have nothing to report but i do want uh i spend no money according to ab1234 certainly not the counties uh, we'll pay for our own gas but the um we will be i will be meeting on thursday morning with the insurance commissioner uh california was invited down by a fire chief in West Point who was working with the fire chief in Amador County. So they wanted to have some representative. I will be going down with uh, CAO Alt and John and our OES director. Uh, we will tell them about our problems with insurance and try to advocate for them to uh, do something about that. This is an issue that RCRC has been taking on. This is an issue that Placer has gone and met with them. Uh, El Dorado, Tuolumne, so we're joining a long train to try to raise the, the volume and, and maybe get some action on behalf of the Department of Insurance. So if you have specific things you'd like me to discuss, if you could um, talk to me after the meeting, I'm happy to uh, carry whatever I do, but I will report back afterwards and we'll also probably post something if we learn anything on the OES website. So, see you all. The only thing I'd like to add uh, along with your announcement is that the number one thing uh, that I've heard from the public as I've gone out and done different engagements has been the concerns about insurance. It's the number one thing from all of our constituents that I've interacted with, uh, followed closely behind by potholes, uh, but you know that's always an important issue. So if insurance and, and rates and cancellations have gotten above that in the level of importance, that's how big a deal it is in our county. So it'll be 
uh, a good opportunity for us. I hope it'll be fruitful. It hasn't been for other counties, but I think between uh, the contingent we're taking, maybe we'll, we'll be the ones that are the influencers or not. Council? Madam Clerk? Yes. Very well. This meeting is adjourned.